soon, we have the beginning of our window of opportunity. And it's wrong in America for this to be happening. Where I come from, that's an obstruction of justice. I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. It was the trial of the century with a celebrity suspect. It divided our nation and shook the criminal justice system to its core. Absolutely 100% not guilty. Now, for the first time, O.J. Simpson speaks out in an exclusive 90-minute, unrehearsed, uncut, uncensored interview. I was the most investigated person in history. I am very skeptical about whose blood that was. Why? Why did they not ask Kato, where's O.J.? Finally, O.J. Simpson breaks his silence and responds to the American public. I don't think anybody disputes that you could not see those blood spots that he claimed to have seen unless he was in the Bronco. 90 minutes of non-stop questioning. If it is changed in any way, I will blow the whistle. Emmy award-winning journalist Ross Becker asks the questions we all want to know. Your time between 9.36 and 10.53, where were you? Who was the person that Alan Park saw walking across your driveway? Why did you lie to the limo driver? Do you agree that there's an amazing number of improbable coincidences? If you were innocent, why did you run? Is this your heart talking that they came to not guilty because of the evidence or because of race? Did you kill Nicole Brown and Ron Gold? This home video cassette documents his first public words and examines the controversial evidence found at his Rockingham home. You're the only one who knows really the truth of what No, no, there's somebody else that knows the truth. Who's that? It's, uh, the person who killed him. Whether you believe he is guilty or innocent, finally, O.J. Simpson speaks out in this explosive, unrehearsed, uncut, no-holds-barred interview. 1-800-O-J-TELLS. Judge for yourself. My name is Ross Becker. The ground rules for this interview are that O.J. Simpson has agreed to answer any and all of my questions. Neither he nor his lawyers have uh, seen or been told those questions in advance. I've agreed not to ask Mr. Simpson questions concerning his children, his personal finances, about any privileged conversations between Mr. Simpson and his attorneys or any questions about any post-trial legal matters. The only people in the room during this interview are the camera operators, O.J. and myself. Also, a copy of this interview will be kept in the custody of my attorney as a guarantee that it will be disseminated exactly as it was recorded in real time. O.J., before we start to unravel this bizarre odyssey that uh, you have gone through, why are you doing this interview? Why did you agree to this interview under these circumstances? Well, uh, I think obviously uh, it's well known that I've been wanting to talk uh, for quite a while. My, um, when the case was over, uh, I wanted to talk immediately. Unfortunately, um, I had some new lawyers, and I was involved in another litigation, a civil suit. Uh, they had some concerns because they hadn't really spent any time with me. They had a lot of concerns uh, that uh, anything I might say may be used against me and not knowing me and not uh, understanding uh, uh, how I see things and how I speak and uh, uh, really not, even though they followed the case, not being totally up on the case, they were they were a little reluctant for me to speak at that time. So was most of my lawyers. They felt that, mm -hmm. that I was at a time where I was still coming down from an emotional, mm -hmm. you know, this emotional thing. Are you um, doing this for the money, too? Oh, obviously. For, obviously. Uh, I, uh, I've spent a career collecting a, a certain uh, wealth. Uh, I've, a lot of people have relied on me over those years, uh, family, in-laws, and, uh, and I've had to use all that up, all those savings up. Uh, uh, to defend myself. Uh, were you coached? Were you coached at all on what to say here today? Not at all. Uh, I think one thing that uh, my new lawyers found, uh, once they sat down with me, and they did sit down with me, they did interview me, uh, and in, in the course of firing questions at me, uh, they felt uh, pretty good about uh, me as a client. About letting, you, letting then, you go yeah, and talk and yeah, say it the way you want to say it. Want to say it. things, yes. I want to begin by talking about two very important moments, and both of them happened in the courtroom. Uh, one was the day you stood before Judge, Judge Lancito and you said that you were 100% not guilty. 
Now, ultimately, of course, the jury agreed with that. But um, the truth is that in the minds of millions of people around the world, you killed Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. They believed that. That's their perception. And now, and because you had a lot of money and you had some innovative lawyers, you're going to get away with it. Can you live with that public perception in the minds of some people? Well, I don't think doing this tape is going to change a lot of minds. Uh, basically, I think the people who have had faith in me and believed in me, uh, hopefully I'll uh, justify that and give them some fodder so that when, when they're out debating with people, uh, 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 you know, have a little more ammunition. But I, I also think that uh, I believe in people. I've always got along with people. I've, uh, I've always found people interesting. And I think basically people are honest and they want to be fair. And I think as this trial goes on and as I speak more, some truths will come out that didn't come out during the course of this trial. I, I felt that during the trial there was a lot of misrepresentations made by the prosecution that for whatever re reason the media used. Uh, maybe it was a better story. I realize now that it's the story, uh, the ratings are more important uh, than the truth, and uh, that's something that has become abundantly clear to me uh, through this ordeal, and especially since this ordeal has been over, and as we speak, uh, hopefully that will become abundantly clear to a lot of our viewers. You, have, you were a very public man. You, your whole career was out in the public, but the question is, you can never be that way again, can you? Well, I don't want to be that way again, to be honest. Uh, uh, I like me. I like uh, my image. I felt a certain responsibility. Uh, I had heroes when I was a kid growing up, and I felt uh, a certain responsibility, and I thought I did well with that responsibility. I wasn't perfect, like no hero, no American, no human is perfect, and I had my faults, but I, despite what I see some of my distractors say, I don't think I went out of my way to work on my image. I think everyone who knew me knew the OJ they saw on TV. The OJ that they work with is the OJ that, that, that the guy that they run around with and hang out with. Uh, most of the people that I've ever worked with uh, in my life had, have become friends and they will say I'm the same guy. The other moment in the trial that we all remember, of course, is the reading of the verdict. Um, not guilty. What, that moment when you heard those words, what went through your mind? I was really numb. Uh, I, I must admit, uh, up until the day before, I thought it would be a hung jury. I thought one or two of the jurors would not vote for acquittal. Um, and uh, I was real concerned about that because Johnny Cochran had told me it'd be maybe two years before he could come back to the case. I knew what Sheck and New felt. These guys had other lives. So, you and looked happy about and you kids. looked relieved. Well, I was relieved, but I was almost numb. I was fighting my emotions. Uh, the one thing I didn't want to do was uh, lose, uh, I don't say lose my cool, but uh, I can say this. Um, I looked at Van Adder, and if Van Adder would have looked at me, I would have lost my cool. Philip Van Adder. Yeah, Phil Van Adder. I would have lost my cool, and I, I was just trying to tell myself that I had gotten through this, I tried to do it with uh, some kind of dignity, and I didn't want to lose it at that moment. Did you think about Nicole? At that moment, no. No, at that moment, I was thinking about I was going to hug Sydney and Justin. I was going to hug Arnell and Jason. I had gone, I had gone, what, 16 months when, when I was, hadn't been able to touch anybody that I loved. I could touch lawyers, but nobody that I can love, and it was real tough. And I'm a toucher, I'm a hugger. Everyone who knows me knows I'm a very affectionate person. And my kids, my son and I, he's 25, we kiss. You know, my young son and I, we kiss. Sydney, Arnell, we're kissers and huggers. And, and I think more than anything, I was saying, I was gonna see my kids. I knew my older kids were strong. Uh, it was my younger kids I was most concerned about. And on my mind that day was, uh, was I, I actually had planned to walk out of that courtroom, take a, uh, a van or a car right down to Laguna and hug my kids. A tough question, but you knew, obviously, Nicole very well. She was your wife mm -hmm. for a long time. What do you think she would have said about the verdict that day? Oh, uh, Nicole would, would have stood by me. Nicole, there's so many people who, 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 are le who are alleged friends. The interesting thing about it, Nicole knew a lot of the weaknesses of the people who are, I think, benefiting from what has happened here. 
And Nicole would have been, you know, like she always was with me when there was a problem, when there was a problem in our family that we, the two of us, no matter what we were going through in our lives, we always stood real strong with one another. When we were apart, something that the press don't seem to want to um, uh, talk about or write about, uh, they want to give a total opposite um, a skew on it, even, even when we were apart, when we were divorced, when we had other lies, whenever there was something major, something emotional, Nicole on a few occasions had some very serious, for her emotional issues come up with her then boyfriends, she didn't call her mother, she called OJ. Her, our, and maybe Core Fishman, her best friend, Faye wasn't in her life at that point in time, but I was a person she came to with problems that you would be really surprised <laughs> that uh, this so-called jealous, uh, possessive in individual that that this woman would come to me with problems that she had with her with her mm -hmm. lovers. We could we could talk for days and go back all over the events of the trial, the specific evidence. But let me ask you about some key questions because people became a soap opera for people and mm -hmm. they followed every day of this trial, and there were nagging questions in people's minds when the verdict was announced not guilty because mm -hmm. things they couldn't understand. Um, and things that they may not have had a clear picture in their mind as to why this happened. The amazing number of improbable coincidences concerning this crime that tie to you. Do you agree that there's an amazing number of improbable coincidences? Not at all. Not at all? Your not blood, at all. Your blood well, um, at the crime scene. I don't believe that was a coincidence. How do you explain it? Well, first of all, if it was my blood, which I don't believe, but if, in fact, it was my blood, it wasn't deposited there that night. I was not there that night. I had spent a lot of time at Nicole's house, uh, probably more at her house than my house in the previous year. Um, uh, I had been there quite a bit. That's where we kept our dogs. I had been there the week previous uh, to these murders because the dogs were fighting, and I had to go over and get one of the dogs and mm -hmm. bring them home. But when I look at the evidence of blood, this so-called blood trail, I asked a lot of questions. I, first of all, I wanted to know why would someone like Mazzola, who collected these blood drops, who claimed in previous testimony under oath that she put her initials on each one of these bindles, but when they got the cell mark and they got the DOJ, there was no initials there. Mm -hmm. Of course, the prosecution, as they did with every witness in this case who dealt with the blood, who was on the scene that day, got her to question her own testimony. In her case, it was maybe maybe she didn't, um, she didn't initial those bindles. When she initialed the bindles on everything else in this case, and every other case she's done, she's done it. She testified she did in this case, and, and for some reason, those initials disappeared. That, Ross, and I, I may go on sometimes because I got yeah. so much in me that I want to say, and I may get a little long at times, that in court one day came out. The prosecution, uh, I guess, in cross-examinations were, were somewhat prepared for it, and they got her to say that maybe, mm -hmm. after she claimed she had under oath, maybe she didn't. That night, I really, I remember Bob Shapiro saying to me, well, that'll be the big story tonight. You know, I'm watching the news that night when I got back to my cell. There wasn't one word uh, mentioned about it. I, I think the big news was some inconsequential ruling Edo had, and to me, it's things like that. That was, a, to me, the best example. This should have been a pi pivotal point. Um, uh, um, You've uh, talked to the, the jury. Was evidence. it a pivotal point? A few of the, I haven't talked to the jury, hmm. but a few of them have mentioned that they found that to be strange. So they were paying attention, but that night none of the pundits spoke about that. Right. And once again, you talk about the public out there. The public got the spin that they got at night, at that, mm -hmm. you know, when they, once they got home at night. But the coincidences still remain. Okay. Uh, again, uh, you know, whether it's yours or not, mm -hmm. the contention, your blood at the crime scene, your blood, coincidence, here at Rockingham, found the same night of, uh, that the crime happened, oh. and in the Bronco. Well, in, if in fact that was my blood here at the home, mm -hmm. if in fact it was, I don't find that to be well, such was a coincidence. It? Was it? I don't think so. But I don't find how that did to it be get a coincidence. Here, okay. How did it get here? How, whose blood was it here at Rockingham? If in fact it was mine, if in fact it was mine, I live here at Rockingham. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're going to be surprised at how little blood is involved in this, this bloody home that I hear. It's three no, there were, there of were blood, drops of blood. Drops of blood on the driveway. <clears throat> yeah. If in fact it happened, if in fact I deposited it, 
it would have not been certainly not after leaving Nicole's house because I hadn't been in Nicole's house and maybe when I was running around I really had absolutely no answer for that mm -hmm. I, I personally I am very skeptical about whose blood that was what about the victim's blood in your Bronco once again it's the, we go back to the same thing uh, I hear about blood being in my Bronco I'm told that there should have been a lot more blood in the Bronco if this was a victim's blood I, it amazes me that that experienced criminalist could look in this car, in this Bronco, looking for blood. This is the trial of the century, the case of all time. I mean, you heard the detectives talk about that from day one, and for two months they can't find blood. Uh, people got in that car looking for blood on this um, um, dashboard and on the, uh, the divider, I guess. I can't recall what they call that. Mm -hmm. Console. Console. And uh, they don't find blood. And months <clears throat> later they find it. They put it all together and they say it's the victim's blood. I find it curious that there was a four allele drop of blood on the steering wheel that didn't come to Nicole, didn't come to Ron Goldman, didn't come to O.J. Simpson. I would submit that if they would have typed that blood, dropped or smudged that they saw on the door handle of the Bronco, mm -hmm. it probably would have been a four allele. Uh, uh, but they didn't. I don't understand how I definitely went to my Bronco right before I left. I opened the door of my Bronco. I went in the Bronco. Allen Park, Cato were here at that time. Why wasn't my finger, uh, fingerprints on the handle of my Bronco? I submit somebody opened that Bronco, didn't want their fingerprints on it, erased it. I submit that there's no way that Mark Furman could have seen the blood spots that he claimed to have seen on the running board and stuff of that car unless the door was open. And I think that was proven. I don't think anybody disputes that you could not see those blood spots that he claimed to have seen unless he was in the Bronco. Your hair found in the knit cap at the crime scene. No, that's, that's uh, inaccurate. It's not. No, I mean, it's an actor. They, no one said that was my hair. They said hair similar to, and I'll go to Hank Goldberg on that. Hank okay. Goldberg, when he was speaking with uh, Henry Lee about uh, um, uh, something that was consistent, I think was the word, consistent, consistent with, with is what they used uh, in court, yes. Uh, and I'll use Hank Goldberg's words on that. Hank Goldberg said to Henry mm -hmm. Lee, mm -hmm. when you say consistent with, you're not saying it is. Right. You're not saying it's a fact. You're saying maybe it could be, uh, and it's again, another that's thing a for the jury to representation. Consider. There's hairs in that hat that they said wasn't consistent with mine. There's hair, hairs that that they said was consistent with mine. But I submit you can take ten black guys, you know, and you'll find that hair consistent with probably a number of them. Size twelve Bruno Mali shoe prints found mm -hmm. at the crime scene. What size shoes do you wear? OJ? Well, coincidence. Well, if you go into my closet, you'll see from 10 and a half to 13s, uh, they focused on 12s. It's coincidence. You know? I understand. Well, it's a coincidence. Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask the public this. The FBI did an exhaustive search about Bruno Magli shoes. Mm -hmm. They said it was a rare shoe. They went to every outlet that sold Bruno Magli shoes. Not one person said they ever sold me right. these Bruno Magli shoes. Now, they said this is a very... Uh, the, the, the most exhaustive investigation of all time, yeah. right? No, I was the most exhaustively uh, investigated person of all time. The case wasn't. Who bought Bruno Magli shoes? Did, did the FBI tell us who in L.A. might have purchased Bruno Magli shoes? Mm -hmm. uh, if they did, we don't know about did that. Did you ever have any? First of all, I would have never worn those ugly shoes, <laughs> you know. Oh, I can't okay. tell you. I can't tell you the name of the shoes I have on now. I, I think with most men... Mm -hmm. Uh, unless they're tennis shoes, you know, uh, Nike, uh, you know, some make of a, a tennis shoe, you know the name of your tennis shoe. I can't tell you the name of any, and I may have upwards of 40 pairs of shoes uh, upstairs, shoes upstairs. Um, I couldn't tell you the name of the shoe. So you I've don't never, know if you I've, ever owned a pair of yeah, those Yeah, I don't know. I've never walked into a shoe store and asked uh, for a name pair of shoes ever in my life. Do you still have the two pairs of gloves that Nicole bought for you? I don't know if Nicole ever bought me gloves. I never recall Nicole ever buying me gloves. Now, we do have, and the prosecution knows this, we do have a uh, uh, discovery from friends of ours, mm -hmm. uh, at least one, uh, that said Nicole bought him two pair of shoes, I mean two pair of gloves, gloves, not these pair of gloves. At Christmas, I buy for possibly, 
I know, over, well over 100 people. Mm -hmm. Nicole normally was in charge of getting Christmas presents for various people. I would buy for my son, for AC, for Marcus Allen, uh, you know, a few of my very close friends I would buy for. But then we had this other group of friends, and Nicole would get the list, and she'd go out and buy for them. I don't know if she bought these gloves for someone. I do know that one person did come forward and also sent the gloves that she had purchased uh, uh, for him. And I'm not sure of this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that was from But you had them on in the photograph? No, no, no. At I the sidelines? I had on gloves that looked similar to them. They may have been that make. I don't know. But if you look at pictures of me on sidelines, mm -hmm. you've seen me wear numerous gloves, numerous colored gloves. Where are any of those gloves? In those pictures, I asked you, where are any of the clothes that I wore in those uh, But the coincidence, I'm talking about public perception and coincidence. Yeah. And isn't it a coincidence that you stand in a photograph with similar gloves on to the gloves that were apparently worn by the murderer? I don't know. It's a coincidence, isn't it? You, you can say it's a coincidence, but I, I submit that any well-dressed man uh, who wears gloves, everybody in the East wears gloves. And I, you can walk down the street and I can guarantee you Time and time again, you'll see similar make gloves. I find it, is it a coincidence that there was no gloves upstairs? Is it a coincidence that I had a, a one glove that looked like these gloves? As a matter of fact, I would submit to you, if I put on the one glove they found upstairs that had lambskin interior, and I stood across this room or you took a picture, it'd be pretty difficult to tell that glove from the gloves that they said I was wearing in the in the, in the, uh, you know, the photographs in the trial. I also say, what happened to the other glove of that? I'm with gloves the way I am with sunglasses. I lose them. I have a thing that I do that I'm mm -hmm. sure the prosecution uh, in their exhaustive investigation has discovered that every six months when I'm in New York, when I leave New York, I give 90% of my clothes away. Mm -hmm. When I leave LA in August, I give 90% of my clothes away. They've investigated this. They talked to my doormen in New York. They talked to my house help here. That's what I do. So if you had gloves there, yeah. <clears throat> they're tossed to the wind. They're somewhere. Possibly. I, you know, I, really, you don't I know. really don't. I don't know where my black gloves are. I don't know where the other <laughs> glove to the lambskin glove mm -hmm. uh, 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 went. But as I say to you, they mm -hmm. took pictures of me wearing an outfit. Right. I asked them, where is any single apparel, except maybe the tie I might still have, uh, that you see in a big coat. There's one big coat I, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure is still back in New York. Wear any of the clothes that you see me wearing in those pictures. Okay. Who was the person that Alan Park saw walking across your driveway just, uh, was it four minutes before 11? Who see, was that person? See, once again, <clears throat> we, we go to Marsha Clark, and I think, if, I hope we have enough time and you ask well, enough questions, I'll try to shorten my answers up yeah. so that we can. I'm going to hit but, these, these points of, that people have questions about. Well, it was never answered. It's never been revealed no, who, what people, who that is. The problem is Marsha Clark. Marsha Clark has given an impression of things, and people are living with those impressions. I'm seeing the pundits on TV commenting on things that were not facts in this case. There was any, never, Mar Alan Park never once said that he saw anybody walking across a driveway. During questioning, he certainly indicated that no, he may he have saw seen. someone right outside the front door of my okay, house. Yes. He put an X on an exhibit to show exactly where that was so there could be no mistaking what, what Marsha said and what has been repeated time and again by the pundits uh, was not true. It so was not evidence in this case. I did walk out the door. I walked out to the door right to the point where he put an X uh, on that picture. So that I dropped uh, some luggage. I took mm -hmm. my golf bags off the bench. I dropped them there. I signaled what I thought was Dale. I thought it was my old limo driver, Dale. Your regular limo driver. Yeah, at that point. I didn't mm -hmm. realize it was uh, someone other than Dale. I don't know if that's the correct time you have it also, mm -hmm. but I dropped that right there, right when Cato evidently let him in. Mm -hmm. He drove up right where those two bags were sitting mm -hmm. is right where he put the X. That's right where I walked to and I turned around, went back upstairs, finished up with my clothes in my bag, put a shirt on, and came right back downstairs in two minutes or so. It didn't take me much more than two minutes to do that. Why did you lie to the limo driver and tell him you were asleep, and that's why you missed his ringing? No, see, that's once again. Uh, Alan Park, who I felt was as honest as he could be, but I think we'll show you quite um, convincingly that his perceptions were, weren't all that reliable that night on virtually everything he spoke about that night. In this instance, I never, ever, ever said that I was asleep, ever. When I walked outside, Cato Kalin 
said to me, did you oversleep? I saw in one report where Cato said to Alan Park when he first saw him, uh, he must have overslept. So I'm assuming with all of this happening, Alan Park just assumed I overslept. The main reason I went to McDonald's instead of just had a bowl of cereal mm -hmm. uh, is because I was trying to stay awake. It was Cato who had said to me when we returned to my house, well, maybe you can take a nap. And I said, hey, I don't have time to take a nap. And I didn't want to take a nap. I was getting on a red eye. Uh, and if you've ever taken red eyes, the Maybe. last thing I wanted to do was sleep before I got on the red eye because I had hoped to be able to sleep on the red eye. What was in the bag? What bag? The bag that Cato Kalin, that apparently you did not let Cato Kalin put in the limousine. See, that's how it was phrased. Well, and that's see, the public yeah. perception of what happened. Yeah, well, that goes like someone walking down the driveway and across the driveway. It was very simple. We were packing. Cato said that there was a bag over there, and I said, yeah, I'll get it since I was going out to my Bronco anyway. I walked by the bag, didn't pick it up when I walked by, went out to my Bronco, really got the guts to my mobile phone and walked back in and picked the bag up, actually picked up two bags, one that Cato never mentioned uh, was a white bag that was also sitting there with balls in it, picked both bags up, walked back to the front of the house, and at that point Cato was talking about finding a... Um, a flashlight. I told him mm -hmm. to look in my kitchen. I actually asked Alan Park to get my golf bag out, but Cato was talking about the flashlight. I walked in my front door, dropped the white bag down, mm -hmm. which somehow got lost in all of and this. And that had golf balls in it. That also had, go that had golf balls in it. It was right by my front door, and I believe in some of the uh, pictures uh, mm -hmm. uh, taken, uh, you'll see that white bag there. So what was in the black bag? Golf balls, golf usable, balls? usable golf balls, and a uh, windbreaker. There was a recent story that I want to ask you about right up front, that uh, Paula Barbieri broke up with you the night that Nicole was murdered, earlier that evening. I learned that uh, in jail. <laughs> what do you mean you learned that in jail? That well, she had left you a message or? Well, yeah, well, actually one day she was, we were talking about something in jail and um, it came up, mm -hmm. you know, that she was, you know, that I don't know. See, Paula and I, uh, as she said in her, and I can't really talk about her deposition, the prosecution know full well that she left that message on a uh, mobile cellular phone, and they also know full well that I never retrieved any messages that right. day. So, so if she so, did? Yeah, I just never retrieved it. And if I had know. retrieved it, it was not a big deal because uh, just a week of actually 10 days previous to that, uh, I, uh, we had gone to Palm Springs, and, and she said this in her deposition, I shouldn't be talking about it, but basically she was upset that I went and played golf, and she left Palm Springs and split up with me, but when I came home I saw her, and we went on with our lives, and that probably would, would, what would have happened that day. The jury said not guilty, but there's, a, there's one thing that most everyone is sure of now, or many people are, and that is the O.J. Simpson that we saw for years on the football field, and we saw on TV commercials and, and in the movies. Um, that's not the real O.J. Um, are you, you can't be real proud of your relationship with Nicole. Yes, I am. Totally proud. There may be an incident or two in our relationship, and any person out there that can't look at one or two instances that they may not uh, be so fond of in a 17-year relationship, they, you know, they're not being honest with us. There's an instance or two in our relationship that I certainly wish had not have happened, but uh, let me tell you about this house. This house was always loaded with people. We couldn't take a trip without all our friends wanting to go with us because we had a loving home, a loving relationship. It was always fun to be around us. That was our relationship. That was our relationship for the full time. Even the year, after being apart a year and a half, when we came back together for a year, everybody, if we took a trip, we couldn't take a trip alone. Everybody wanted to go with us because we were fun people to be with. O.J., everybody, everybody heard Nicole's sister on the stand say that you physically and emotionally abused Nicole. Everyone has heard the 911 tape. Okay, let's, you know, I'm in a funny place with Denise. The, I believe in family. You see, I have a strong family. I know right now Denise, Nicole would not be happy with Denise. Uh, let me say, hmm. She's sitting in Justin's aunt. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm really in a funny well, place here, but morally me, for myself. You, but let me, let me say this. Let me say this. Anyone that knew Nicole 
knew where they stood with her. They knew what she was about emotionally, where they stood emotionally. Nicole didn't take any crap from anyone. I think her mother has been pretty clear on that. She did from that. you, let, OJ, let, let, didn't she? Let me, let, let me All right, I'm sorry. Here. Go ahead and finish, um, you know. Uh, she didn't take any crap from anyone. She gave as much as she got from anybody and everybody. She was not a wallflower. She did not stand around. If I was out of line publicly with friends, they've seen it, with house help, with nannies, with people who've lived in this house. Mm -hmm. uh, the, po the prosecution talked to all of those people, and the, the reason you didn't see them in court, because it wasn't the picture that they were trying to paint of me. Nicole was a strong woman who didn't take crap from anybody, and that's not the image that Denise has been uh, promoting out there. Anyone who knows her knows that, and even Denise said that originally when it wasn't beneficial to go another way. Mm -hmm. She said Nicole didn't take any crap from anybody, including Denise. I can say this. And I can say this, and many people will back me up on this. I was with Nicole for 17 years, and I can tell you I saw her cry. And Nicole didn't cry much. Mm -hmm. More about Denise than anything, everything else combined. You're saying Denise has betrayed your relationship with Nicole? Totally. And betrayed Nicole, the image of Nicole, the type of person Nicole was with. You go to people who've known Nicole for 10, 15 years. Plus, let me say this, Denise was never around. We went six months a year without seeing Denise. We saw Denise during periods of times when there were family events and she was around. Denise was not a person that Nicole, I can tell you this, in the year that Nicole and I was apart and she had mm -hmm. another group of friends, a lot of guy friends, she did not bring Denise around those people. Let's talk about the 911 call. Yes. In 1989, I was wrong. 1989, I locked her out of my bedroom, she got a key and came in and I physically removed her from that bedroom. She sustained some bruises mm -hmm. doing that. Uh, some superficial bruises, nonetheless bruises. Um, I'm a big guy. If I punch the person, they're going to swell up. They're going to look punched. I did not punch her. But I physically removed her from my bedroom. Uh, and Nicole is a person that you can't physically do anything with without uh, a struggle. I was wrong. Uh, uh, Detective Farrell, who testified, who investigated the case, I made no excuses. I was wrong. I was willing to face whatever they wanted me to face. Uh, uh, to next day, I made absolutely no excuses. It was a front page story, even though I'm hearing uh, uh, from certain special interest groups that oh, they swept it under the rugs. This was a front page story. We had two newspapers then. Herald mm -hmm. Examiner had a big right. front page story on it. Uh, I went to court, even though Nicole and our uh, relationship was very strong the time I went to court, I pleaded no contest, not to drag my uh, family through this. I was giving community, given community service time, which I did. When it was over, the judge made me do more. He didn't accept some of my uh, community service time. I saw a therapist alone and with Nicole. We went mm -hmm. to uh, um, uh, therapy together and I went alone. Not only did I go alone for the time that they gave me, to this day I still see that therapist from time to time when I feel I need another perspective on uh, certain relationships uh, that I might be in, even though I hear and I read that, oh, he didn't do anything, uh, they swept it under the rug, this thing was anything but swept under the rug. Do you have a volatile temper? I don't think so. I am argumentative. I'm loud anyway. I've been on a golf course with my group. They know we're loud. I want to go on with this 911 All right, stuff. yeah, we've got a lot more to talk okay. about. The 911 call that you hear, say, there's an impression that that 911 call is there was some something physical took place. Nothing physical took place in the 911 call where you hear Nicole right. speak. I don't apologize for that. I truly don't apologize for that. But her voice was so afraid in that 911 call. Yes, but her voice wasn't afraid 10 minutes earlier when she was yelling at me. She called me. This is something that the prosecution, mm -hmm. the Tammy Bruces of the world don't want you to hear. There's another take about that night. You listen to that tape. You listen to the police uh, receptionist uh, tell her, what does he want? Well, what is he doing now? Well, he knocked on the bedroom door. And where is he now? He went downstairs. Uh, what did he want? He wanted to know why the bedroom door was locked. Of course I wanted to know. I went home, not to argue. I left her house that night because I didn't want to argue about the matter we were arguing about. She called me, reminded me that I said we had to talk everything out and argue everything out. That was one of the conditions that I had set on coming back to her for a year when, mm -hmm. when I agreed to try the relationship again. Uh, so, yes, I was wrong. I got in my car. I went there. We argued. And in the course of arguing, she turned and walked in the house. I walked behind her. I kicked the door. 
a door that was already broke. If you listen to the video, you listen to a surreptitiously taped tape that the police officer did when he arrived without telling us that I guess they've been listening to it for amusement uh, for the, you know, the year that uh, followed that. You hear her say the door was already broke. We're in an argument. Cato arrives. You guys shouldn't be arguing. Mm. I think she's still downstairs. We're in the midst of an argument. I don't know if she went upstairs. And when she went upstairs, I walked upstairs. I knocked on her bedroom door. I didn't kick it in. I knocked on her bedroom door. She didn't want to come out and argue. I went back downstairs and continued to vent my frustration and my side of the argument to Cato Kalen. At one point, the police officer asked on the phone, tell her to stay in her room. She says, I don't want to stay in my room. She comes downstairs. She's in the room with me. This is not a woman that's afraid. The police aren't there. She came downstairs in the room that I was in. Mm -hmm. And I think she's on the phone with her mother, complaining to her mother. I don't know that the police have been called. I certainly wouldn't be sitting there yelling, if, knowing that she's behind that door holding up the phone for the police. But an interesting thing came, as I said, in this surreptitiously taped, uh, which is, I guess you would call a spontaneous uh, utterance. The guy asked her about previous um, um, incidences. She mentions one, New Year's 1989. The guy asked her, did you think he was going to hit you? She says, no, I don't think OJ would hit me. He had to do a community service. Okay. I don't think he would hit me. So this was an argument. This mm -hmm. was a family argument. When it was over, I left. All those things are on the record. Yeah. I left. She called me the next day and apologized for calling the police because, and I'll, I can show you this, uh, you can hear this, if they ever play the surreptitiously tape, tape. Nicole called me. I went home not to argue. She called me to come back there to argue. And it was only an argument. Nothing physical between the two of us happened then. She also mentioned then that since 1989, O.J. has never touched me. She told the police that, a spontaneous utterance, which I guess has some validity in a courtroom. During various times, though, um, were you spying on her? Were you hiding in the bushes? Never. Well, you were at one point hiding in the bushes, weren't you? Watching her have Certainly oral not. sex on, on the couch. Certainly I mean, that's not. what's been written and, and, and well, said. Of course that's been written, because that's the story they want to put out there. That's Certainly absolutely not. not true. Absolutely You never spied false. on her. Never. I've, here's, we're two people that live in the same neighborhood. We've been going out together for 15 years. We, at that time, liked the same places same restaurants, same music. You know, in a year and a half, her and I showed up in the same place twice. Now, all of a sudden, the prosecution made the, tried to make those two times uh, stalking. Well, in one of those instances, I had had dinner with a friend. He suggested that we go by this uh, uh, Mezzaluna place. It was a happening night, and we went in. And when we went in that place, Nicole spotted us. She came over to us. She kissed my friend. She kissed me. She asked us to join them. And join him. I don't know. There's a. They tell me this. Uh, Keith is. I don't know. I don't know him from anybody. There's a bunch of people there that night. I guess I met him. I bought them drinks. They bought me drinks. Nicole was going dancing with with Cora Fishman, her best friend. They invited me to go dancing with them. I went dancing with them. Nicole and I went to her home together that night. We were separated. We were living apart. That's a stalking incident that you've heard. Yeah. Right. That that's supposedly a stalking incident. Uh, the other one. Uh, I, we went, it was an opening of a restaurant called Trist. I was joining a party that was there before Nicole's party arrived. So how do you stalk a person if the people are there before their mm -hmm. people? I mean, I'm, I'm joining a, a table of six. But those are the only two incidences of stalking. After the Trist incident, which was roughly 10 days, maybe two weeks mm -hmm. from the Mezzaluna incident, I went by Nicole's house. We had promised each other that if we got involved in another relationship, we'd let the other person know. At that point in time, we were in the midst of our divorce. We were having dinner together with the kids three or four nights a week. She still came here. Some nights even slept here. I still went to her house. I went by her house. I had gone to a dance after the uh, Trist thing. I had gone by her house. I had no girlfriend. She had no boyfriend. As I approached her front door, her window was open, wide open. And I saw her head, and I looked. I saw what was happening. I didn't bang on the window. I didn't try to stop them. I did hit the doorbell as I left, just so they'd be aware that they were kind of in the open. Mm -hmm. The next day, I spoke to her mother, and I went by to speak to Nicole about it, about the incident. No argument, no nothing. I just, my concern was it was relatively open in a house that my kids were at. We didn't have an, an argument about it. She said she was wrong. Even Keith, as I was leaving, said, you're right. 
it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Period. I shook the man's hand and I left. I continued to see this guy throughout the summer, even though there was nothing romantic between, and she admitted it was a mistake, and none of her friends, no one, not any friend in Nicole's will ever tell you that there was anything romantic between the two. This was, yeah. as Nicole said, something that just happened that night. They had been drinking, and who knows, and uh, she said it was a mistake, and never, ever, ever at any other point that we talk about it, uh, did it come up. Whenever I saw him, I always asked him about his golf game, and that was the extent that of that. That was the extent of it. In your suicide letter that, that you wrote, you said that you considered yourself a battered husband. What kind of, what was that self-pity all about? Is that what that was? Well, you, you know. You a battered husband? O.J. Simpson, big guy, can take care of well, yourself? That, that, that is a problem that when I, when I am free to speak and I go, and I plan to speak to women's groups, uh, I, I think that's an issue. Uh, that's um, an issue that, you know, battery is just not a one-way street. Uh, I think it's more an attitude than anything. Just because it doesn't hurt when someone hits you, or uh, someone slaps you, or someone in front of people is verbally abusive to you, to me all that constitutes battery. Um, Nicole was a loving person, but Nicole was a confrontational person. Not only with me, with other people. Uh, there are incidences where I'm in my backyard and I hear Nicole with friends, mm -hmm. and you're free to interview them. Uh, Nicole's running down the street because she's been in a confrontation with a neighbor, and I'm over the wall going nose to nose with some big guy one block up, you know, because Nicole had a confrontation with him. There as, are you sit here, when, as you sit um, here today, do you still think you're a battered husband or were a battered husband, battered boyfriend? I think battered is, is you made a point earlier when you said there was fear in Nicole's voice. See, I thought there was a... That's what the world heard on that 911 yeah, tape. Yeah, and who was she afraid of? She was afraid of you at that moment. No, she wasn't afraid of me at that moment. That's, that's total BS. That's the presumption. Well, they don't. That's presumption because like everything else in this case, they just want to hear a piece of things and not the whole thing. If they were given the whole, I mean, I, I think most people, if they make a business decision or a lifelong decision, they look at the entire picture. Mm -hmm. In that case, they should have heard the entire tape and the surreptitious tape. If you hear that whole tape, your conclusion would be this was a control. Mm -hmm. This was a, a situation where two people, Cato Kalin was there, two people were in an argument. One person had argued out mm -hmm. and disappeared, and the other person was continuing to argue, and it was a matter of control at that in instance. Maybe she felt fear at that moment. She certainly didn't feel fear five minutes later, ten minutes later. Mm -hmm. And she expressed the fact that she didn't think I would hit her. I hadn't been physical uh, with her other than the 89 incident. She expressed that. And this is a woman that at the time was trying to get the police to get me to leave. Um, Have you, what was the last thing you said to Nicole? Do you remember the last words that you spoke to Nicole? <sighs> Sydney was beautiful. Sydney is beautiful. Yeah. That was at the recital. Yeah, it was just, it was almost mild, uh, she's beautiful. You know, because mm -hmm. we really didn't talk that night. She's beautiful. We had actually spoken that day mm -hmm. about tickets. Have you been to her grave? Yes. What kind of experience was that for you? Uh, once again, it's uh, the press. I arrived there early one morning with AC, and um, when I got on my knees to meditate, I... I mean, I wasn't even there two minutes. AC said, OJ, here comes the press. And I looked up and saw members of the press running towards us, and so I left. Mm -hmm. So much to talk about. Yeah. There are so many questions in this case. Let me just ask them to you as quickly as I can, and let's mm -hmm. see if we can get them answered for people. Your time between 9.36 on the day of the, the evening of the murders and 10.53. It's time that the prosecution says is unaccounted for. But let me ask you this question. Where were you? At the time, I was a 46-year-old man who lived basically alone. Cato lived out back. Mm -hmm. Cato will tell you, I rarely saw this guy. Rarely saw this guy. I go to bed. I'm a guy who normally goes to bed at 8 or 8.30. I'm up at 4.30, 5 o'clock every day. Paula mm -hmm. Barbieri told you. Told, uh, you've heard this week Paula Barbieri's comments about that. Every day. Why, when does a man have to be held accountable for where he's at when he's in his bedroom, when he's in his home? Well, when he's I a suspect for murder. That's, that's what the prosecution well, says. We uh, want to know where you were during that time. Well, if they would have, when they asked me, I answered all the police questions mm -hmm. about where I was that night. Basically, whatever questions they asked me, 
I answered. But basically, I was home. To me, once I get the 360 North Rockingham, when you come inside of those gates, I'm at home. You were here during that I time. I was here during that time. So the, the, the time that the prosecution claims generally that Nicole and Ron Goldman were murdered, you were here in this I, house. Where I am the majority of the time, basically alone, all the time. So, I mean, somehow I heard uh, there's no alibi. I said, I never have an alibi. When has Cato ever known, ever known, in the five or six months that he lived here, I guess Cato could tell you maybe twice uh, he saw me uh, after 8.30 mm -hmm. <laughs> sitting around this house. I mean, when do you have to be held accountable for being in your bedroom, for being in your own home? Well, your trip to Chicago was a moment at the trial, uh, and this is a question that people have asked me, and, and it's been around. When you got the phone call, yeah. someone said to you on the phone, who was a police officer, said that Nicole was dead. Murdered was the words he used to me. Murdered. Nicole was murdered. My, my words to him, I'll never forget. Because <laughs> I was laying when I answered the phone, and when he said murdered, I kind of set up because I knew it couldn't have been a prank. Uh, and I, you know, you hear those words, I mean, what, what do you mean? This, he said to me, OJ, we don't know. There's nothing we can tell you. We're just trying to find out ourselves. We don't know anything. Your kids are fine. Your kids are fine. And he proceeded to tell me about the kids being at a mm -hmm. police station. I can tell you this. At 6 o'clock that night, after flying to L.A., after mm -hmm. spending the whole afternoon with the LAPD, I knew just as much from the LAPD, their same words, if you look at the interview they did with me, were the exact same words that this Officer Phillips used to me on the telephone. We don't know anything. We're trying to find out. We can't tell you anything, is what he told me then, what they told me when I got here at 360 North Rockingham out front, what they told me during the course of the interview, uh, when they were interviewing me, and at one point I said, come on, you guys, you keep telling me, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're going to tell me something, you keep asking me questions, tell me something. Their words then was the exact words that they gave me that morning. We don't know. There's nothing we know. We're trying to find out. The story was that he said he told you Nicole was dead, and you never asked how or why. No, he said Nicole was murdered. That's and what you And he might recall? have said Nicole was killed. I could mm -hmm. be wrong there. He might have said Nicole was killed. But I know my words to him was, what do you mean? And I know he gave me a litany at that point that there's nothing. We don't know anything. We can't tell you anything. We're trying to find out, OJ. We don't know anything, but your kids are fine. Actually, he said your kids were fine mm -hmm. before he told me that Nicole had been killed. You cut your hand, supposedly, in Chicago. Yes. I have never personally figured all of this out, where you cut your hand a lot around the house, and that's the, your explanation as to why, if it's your blood, it would be at the crime scene and around here. No, no that's and then, not my all right, explanation and then, at all. Right, I know <laughs> that, I know that. Let, okay. me, let me finish. But then the public hears, well, you cut your hand in Chicago, and that's, that's how uh, the blood could have gotten in other locations. The blood is a coincidence, it's a story that is, is in a story in itself with DNA and all of that complicated testimony that we went through. The prosecution kept saying, though, that the blood is the key to convicting O.J. Simpson. Mm -hmm. That's why they uh, conveniently had their most inexperienced people, knowing it was uh, maybe the case of the century. They purposely went out of their way to get their the most inexperienced people to collect the blood, to process the blood. And you know what's interesting to me is that if the blood was the key to their case, why is it that the most contradictory uh, testimony in this case, where witnesses have taken a complete 180, has all been with these LAPD blood collection people? Yeah. You know, why? How many people were in on this conspiracy that you claim? I don't claim anything. I don't claim anything, you know? I, I just, I don't claim that I'm innocent, I am innocent. I don't make any claims outside of that. Was there I'm a conspiracy an man. to frame you? I think obviously the LAPD, I don't know if they felt I was guilty or not, but obviously people in the LAPD went out of their way to make me look guilty, starting with Gil Garcetti with his uh, opening gamut 
with uh, releasing the 911 tapes, knowing, knowing there weren't eight or nine. They've investigated that. They've been get investigated the computer records. They put out memos and, 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 and calls to every L.A. police officer who worked in West L.A. to come forward. If you've ever been to O.J. Simpson's house for any, any type of domestic discord, and they just weren't there. Yet he knew that when he went on his national campaign talking about uh, domestic violence and 8 and 9, 911 calls. There is just no, zero evidence to that. I was the most investigated person in history. This wasn't the most investigated case. OJ was the most investigated person in history. They couldn't find one person has ever seen me be other than Denise. Mm -hmm. And she, yeah, she's seen Nicole and I have our fights. One person out there that had ever seen bruises on Nicole other than 89, ever seen me be violent with Nicole, they offered up to $200,000 to ex-girlfriends of mine. We hear that I've been abusive to women, ex-girlfriends of mine, women who dated me. Don't you find it curious that not one, not one person has come forward, not one person, and they need the money, mm -hmm. has come forward to say OJ was ever abusive. Not one person outside of Denise has ever come forward and said they ever seen me abusive with Nicole. And other than 89, not one person who known Nicole, saw her daily, has ever come forward to say they saw her bruised, mm -hmm. ever. There were times, OJ, when you got preferential treatment from the police. When? That's the story that, that they when? would come here to this house. They would say, "OJ, it's okay." Or, or when? Uh, well, you name one. Well, I saw this. Uh, the yeah, Arlen, Faye Arlen Resnick's Brown. book uh, goes Arlen, through two oh, or three Jesus, of them. Jesus. Let me, we'll get the Faye Resnick. Yes, we will. You know. But I know uh, you don't believe what she says, and you think she's out. I don't believe what she said. I don't, it ain't a matter of believing what she said. Marsha Clark. They sent people out to try to confirm her stories. And you know what they found out? She lied. I can show you time and again in her book she lied. I don't want to go into Faye just yet, because okay. I want to take some time with Faye Rusnick. Uh, um, you talk about Chicago. I hear, oh, how could you break your hand when you throw a glass down? I didn't break my hand uh, yeah. throwing a glass down. The glass broke. I was going back and forth to the phone, trying to get a flight out of there. At one point when I was trying to clean the glass up and push it into the sink, I had a face towel and some toilet paper and stuff. That's when I cut my finger. Now, enough people saw me going to Chicago. I signed autographs at the airport. I signed autographs on the airplane. When I arrived in uh, Chicago, three people were standing there, a security guard, mm -hmm. the, the people that work at the hotel. I signed autographs at the desk, you know? Uh, I didn't have bandages. I wasn't bandaged up. I wasn't trying to hide my hands, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, if you if you were innocent, why why did you write that suicide letter? Why did you run? I didn't run. That's a total misconception. Well, that's if I went to run and I felt guilty, I would have had plenty of time during the week to to get upwards of fifty thousand dollars and been long gone. So you had ten yeah. grand with you. Uh, I didn't really have ten grand. I may have had with me in the car. I had nothing because that morning when I was told that I was going to be arrested and uh, go in, I, I looked and took whatever cash and a couple of checks that I had and gave it to AC. Did you know that your attorneys had made a deal that you could surrender and not be arrested? Mm, yeah. yeah. But so you that knew was, that deal had been made? Yeah, and that was all immaterial to me that morning. Uh, but I had given AC uh, some money. I told him to give Paula some money to take her flight. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't feel that Arnell or Jason would want to work, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, obviously, and their father was being arrested for murder. Um, but you knew you I didn't, didn't do it, him. so... This wasn't about not doing it, man. It's, it it's wasn't about that. What was know, it I about, spent OJ? A week, I spent a week d trying to deal with the murder of probably my favorite person ever on this earth, next to my mom, Nicole. I had spent a night with my kids. My son wanted to play video games. My daughter wanted me to read her stories, and... <laughs> I mean, they didn't cry. They were happy. Uh, my daughter only had said to me that she didn't want to go to the wake the next day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, and it was like they didn't even know. Nicole was a super mom. I mean, she, you know, n you know, no one could ever say, I didn't say always, she was a great mom. I never had an argument about decisions she made with the kids, whatever money she didn't have to account because I knew most of it would be spent on the kids. 
So you weren't running, and, but what, no, what was it and, all about? And, and, um, Why get in a, in a truck and head off somewhere? Where were uh, you and AC going to go? We went to the cemetery. I wanted to see a grave. Mm -hmm. I had been that week, and I know it's it maybe kind of selfish. I was attacked all week. As my mother told me later on, they weren't attacking me. They were attacking this image they had of me. But I couldn't decipher that at the time. I was on medication of some sort that I didn't know that I've since found uh, has a tendency when you first start it may make you a little more depressed. I was totally depressed. Did you have a gun with you? Uh, yes, I had a gun with me. I had the gun with me when I left here earlier that week. When I went down there, my thoughts were, I just wanted it to stop. I wanted what I was feeling to stop. I, did, I had a, a very sketchy memory of, of where Nicole was buried because I was mm -hmm. so close when we were there. And I was more concerned about my kids and I, I could recall cameras on a wall, mm -hmm. but I, didn't, I never saw her grave. I never saw it, and I, that's what I wanted. I wanted to go to her grave, and whatever I would have done there, I can tell you I was at peace. When I was driving down there, I was at total peace. Mm -hmm. What I had been feeling all week to me was behind me, and I, I, I just honestly wanted to be with Nicole. When you went down, did you intend to commit suicide? I didn't know what I wanted to do. What did I is? wanted it to stop, I know that. Why, why did you change your mind and not do it, not take your life? Well, when we got there, AC said right away, uh, we can't go in, there's a police car blocking the entrance. And I said, well, isn't there another way to get in? And he drove around to some houses where there was a wall that he said, and looking between the houses, he said, well, it, it's right there. Yeah. And I think we saw people walking around. So I said, well, just go park somewhere. And he went to a orange grove and parked in Orange Grove, strangely enough. And uh, um, I know we were there for a while, and I think we turned on the radio then mm -hmm. and became aware of what was. Aware that you were a fugitive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, LAPD and, was calling you yeah. a fugitive hey, at that point. Look, I can give a shit at that time what LAPD thought. I mean, well, that's how I felt. I know. I know. But you know? that's. Uh -huh. um, I wasn't concerned about LAPD. You know, I was concerned with. It would stop in how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I asked AC, uh, well, let's just wait a while and maybe they'll leave. Mm -hmm. And at some point he got out of the car and I laid down in the back of the car and uh, I did have the gun out. And uh, at some point he came back, saw me and said, Juice, I'm taking you home. And he just started talking to me and I said, yeah, take me to my mom. And, and How close did you come to pull up, that trigger? Okay. I don't know. I don't you know. don't know. I can't. I can't, I can't say. I can't say. I, uh, a desperate moment for you, though, right? Personally. I didn't feel desperate at the time. Yeah. Actually, I felt calm. Mm -hmm. I truly felt, I felt that the pain that I was feeling at the time would stop. That's when really the, the whole thing started for yeah. you. AC With started the back up the freeway. Yeah. He uh, made some phone calls saying that we were heading home uh, and, and after that I recall helicopters, helicopters and, and, and press and, and, and well the press I mean since that time that I saw this one guy uh, mm -hmm. to Geneva on TV and this is what I've been fighting I guess since then uh, because they don't have facts and mm -hmm. and what has been totally disconcerting is then they go and make up what they want to make up to to I guess <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't know what. There will you know, always be misinformation. In a yeah, case this I, big, OJ, you have to realize there's misinformation. This is lying. This Jennifer sat on TV mm -hmm. on a Larry King show and lied and said that when they found, when they discovered him, why did he go to the graveyard if he was two or three exits past the cemetery when they saw him? Nobody. I've read everything in this case. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever said that. This guy made that up on the spot. We were actually roughly, probably ten miles coming back to L.A. from the cemetery, heading north on the 405. I guess he would say he was trying to make it to Canada now, uh, on the 405, coming home at that time. Why didn't A.C. stop and pull over? He sees a friend. I wanted to go to my mom, and A.C. was going to get me to my mom. Eventually he came here. Mm -hmm. Well, my mom when was, we was, she was, was here. here. Oh, you yeah. assumed that. That's yeah. why you came back yeah. here. Yeah. 
It was a bizarre moment for most people in the country who saw it, in the world who saw it. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting for me, um, you know, I, I, I consider it almost insignificant in terms of, of this whole uh, experience. In the trial itself now, um, DNA evidence has been used in thousands of cases around the world uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. But suddenly in this case it came under scrutiny. Well, uh, obviously there are other cases where, where they've, uh, they've looked at DNA evidence and questioned it. But in this case, it seemed that every time the prosecution came up with some DNA match with incredible odds that said that it's got to be O.J. Simpson. Well, let's get totally real here. They came well, up I'm, with matches I'm, and results before there were tests done. They knew the results. In my opinion, Tracy Savage had a report. And we all know. I mean, let's, you know, if we're going we're gonna to hold everybody accountable, let's hold them accountable, too. Someone gave her results of, of tests right on the button, even before the test was supposedly sent out to be tested. You know, I mean, you know, why, why, do, why do people want to be, want to be blind to this? Why do they want to be blind to that? The, if you look in this case, you look at our witnesses, mm -hmm. how many of our witnesses did a 180 on their testimony? When you look at the witnesses who took a complete back face on a cross-examination or on redirect by the prosecution, they're all, they're all prosecution witnesses mm -hmm. trying to explain things. DNA is only as good as the people who are processing it. There's that we have a human element there. It's only as good as people process it. I, I'm interested in DNA and I believe in DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, I read of all P Patricia Cromwell's books and stuff. I knew all about DNA before this case began. Uh, Barry Sheck and Peter Newfeld. I'm very interested in what they do. I spent a lot of time with Bob Blazer. I find mm -hmm. it very interesting that DNA, when there's body fluids mm -hmm. and rape cases and stuff, you know how many people they get out of jail? Possibly when DNA come up, maybe a third of the people mm -hmm. with rapes and stuff. That means a third. How many people are in jail, innocent people are in jail, that the prosecution had these slam dunk cases, they put innocent people in jail, and fortunately, the good side of DNA when it comes to rapes and in situations like that, they prove that these people didn't do it. And that same prosecutor, probably Gil Garcetti has done his share of them, maybe Marsha did it there, share them, was just as convinced that these people were innocent. Let I mean, me I'm just, sorry, guilty. guilty. Let me just ask you this question as a, as a person would ask you sitting across. I mean, I, I don't have, this is not a prepared question or anything. No. But it seems to me that what you're saying is that everybody's out to get you. The police are out to get you. No. The prosecutor's out to get you. They'll, they'll trump up evidence. They'll sneak it here. They'll do it here. And all of a sudden, they come up with OJ's guilty. Well, uh, no, how and, much? And it, how much? No, 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 it doesn't I, I sound... I disagree with that. I, know, I but disagree with that. Okay. I, dis I disagree with That's that. That's an impression I'm getting. It doesn't take many people. I, I may not doubt that maybe... Well, I, I question. I, at one point, I thought... And early in the trial, when I was uh, somewhat uh, had some admirations for Marsha's uh, uh, passion, mm -hmm. uh, I thought maybe she was convinced that I had done this crime. As the case went on, and I saw her misrepresent evidence, and since I've been out of jail, and I hear what various witnesses had told me how she tried to intimidate them mm -hmm. and consequently not use them when they didn't like what they had to say, like, like Cora Fishman, Nicole's best friend. Then I realized that uh, she obviously had her doubts because if she had a mountain of evidence that she thought was solid evidence, she wouldn't have tried to misrepresent so much of the evidence and also try to uh, 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 impact uh, some witnesses. So you think she knew you were innocent but I couldn't I, turn I back? That, I think at one, one point of the case that she, she felt that, I saw a statement uh, that she said there wasn't enough evidence, and then the next day, the, not her, but the DA's office, uh, since the case, uh, came and said she wasn't talking about my case, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, but I know this, if you got the goods, you don't have to resort to some of the things that they resorted to. Mm -hmm. okay. And we could talk about all of those things. Yeah. Uh, those are things that I can't wait hopefully to have enough time to, to go That's into. That's the problem here. Yeah. We have a certain amount of time. Time is always yeah. finite. I, I we can no talk doubt. for days yeah. about can, all of this. I found it curious that someone like Mark Furman, hmm. uh, at one point, oh, this was an honest cop. How can they say, th even Van Adder, of all people, saying, oh, this is a fine cop. How can you say these things about this cop? Uh, I love Lang, because all the time, Lang said, I didn't know him. This is the only time I worked for him. And Lang is a police officer that... Uh, 
I hate to use the phrase the best of a bad lot, but you know, I thought that there was a certain amount of integrity to him. Um, Mark Furman uh, didn't even know whether you were home or not. Yes, he did. Why would he? If he'd have found a glove before he knew if I was home or not, you would, you would have an argument. But he didn't find that glove until he knew when I left, what time I left. Even though he, Phillips, Van Adder, Lang all testified that they didn't hear Cato. They climbed my wall. They were looking for O.J. Simpson. They claimed that, they're, that he might be bleeding, that somebody else might be bleeding, that there might be a killer on this case. They don't know what they expect. They mm -hmm. claim that. That's why they came over the wall. Yet the first person they found on the property, none of them asked where O.J. was. And if they asked, nobody listened to where O.J. was and O.J. might be, and they want to get in this house, they, they admit it, that they would have knocked down the front door if they hadn't found these people. Why? Yet they let my daughter walk in first. Yeah. They're so concerned. Why they did they want to get in this house so badly, though? Why? Were they setting you up? Is that the deal? Press, that the will, you ask, will you ask that question? Will you, will you ask the press to answer that, that? Ask that question? Will you ask them if they were so concerned about O.J. Simpson and looking for O.J. Simpson and there may be a crime here, why? Why did they ask, not ask Cato, where's O.J.? They're at O.J.'s house. Here's a guy they don't know. They claim nobody asked where O.J. was. They claim that. Mark Furman later on said he talked to O.J., then he went out for 20 minutes. You might, we'll walk back there. It takes you two, three minutes to walk back there, look around as much as you want, and come back. Five minutes to do that. For 20 minutes, he's, he's gone. He doesn't say, come with me. Oh, we got big concerns here. Come with me, going back there. They weren't looking for a dying person or a possible uh, a criminal. He wasn't looking for it. He didn't even draw his gun. I've heard it said Mark Furman is a racist, but he didn't plant the evidence. Of course, that's what people yeah. say. Yeah. Well, they they believe say. they believe he's a racist. Yeah. They believe he's a bad person, yeah, a bad cop, if you will. But they don't believe he put that glove there. Why? Because they've been following the press. Why? There's a whole lot of people that think he did. I, for one, mm -hmm. at the for a long time, my lawyers would tell you I wasn't buying into that. Okay. I wasn't buying into Mark Furman planting the glove. But at one point, I looked at his when I saw him on the stand and I listened to him. And I saw, I started seeing all these little inconsistencies in their testimony. I am totally, 100 convinc uh, com percent convinced that he did. Race, totally. race became a big I mean, issue. Is that a, is that a coincidence? You talk about coincidences. Well, yeah. Is that a coincidence that this man has talked about in the past, planning evidence? I heard one thing on this tape that the mm -hmm. jury didn't hear. He said, I would never stand around. You come around there standing around waiting for somebody to come and tell them what to do. I'm not that kind of police officer. I'm a doer. Yet he wants us to believe that he sat around for two and a half hours, did nothing, never talked about O.J. Simpson and some prior incident that he was aware of. He expected us to believe that. We've heard him on the tape saying this is what he doesn't do. This is what he despises in police officers. Yet he wants us to believe for two and a half hours, minimum, he sat around and did absolutely nothing. And why does he want to get you so bad, O.J.? Why would he want to get any black man or Mexican-American a minority group. You have to ask Mark Furman. I, I think he tried to, I don't he, know if he ever tried to explain it in his tapes. You know, I keep hearing these pundits on TV saying, well, he was talking to a, um, uh, a screenwriter. They forget. There were live witnesses that walked into that courtroom. Uh, there was a Kathleen Bell and Andrea Terry, people that the prosecution, Marsha Clark, was prepared to barbecue, knowing that, this, that they were telling the truth. She had heard from other people in the DA's office about Mark Furman. She knew full well, yet every chance she had to down Kathleen Bell, to imply that this woman was a scorned woman and wait till we get, I can't tell you how many times you heard her dart, wait till we get to these women. Fortunately for these women, I mean, where's Tammy Bruce? They were going to vilify these two women before those tapes came out. They were vilifying them before these tapes came out, knowing, knowing that these women were telling the truth. You have said that all your life you tried to ignore race. Yes, and I still, when I say ignore, I try to ignore prejudice. I never tried to ignore race. I was born black. I was raised in the, uh, in the I don't even call it a ghetto, in the projects. I loved where I was raised. And often I would say to Nicole, I wish my kids could have been raised the way I was raised. Uh, because it was family, it was friends, it was community. We were together uh, all my life. Uh, I hear people talk to me about race, oh, he's not black enough, or he just became black. You look at where I've given money my life. It's always been to the community. It's always been to the links 
a black female national society, uh, to my neighborhood where I grew up. Now, I've been involved in raising money for many charities, but when it comes out of my pocket, it normally goes to a minority group. Isn't it ironic that it was probably, depending on which legal expert you listen to, it was probably the race card that got you acquitted? You know, I hear this race card. Let's, let's, let's analyze this so-called race card. The deck, this is called deck. The deck of cards. cards was, was introduced by the media and the, the so-called pundits immediately. The minute they convened a grand jury, I saw Irina. I saw so many of the pundits and writers uh, in this area write mm -hmm. what that impact would be. Uh, that the case would be downtown instead of in Santa Monica, and it was all under racial uh, lines. I then saw the first hand dealt from that deck, uh, if you don't want to count Mark Furman. Well, uh, I was going to say, media, it was Mark again. Furman, according to you, it yeah. was Mark Furman who played the first race card because yeah, he planted possibly. the glove because yeah, you're a black possibly. man. Well, you know, you, you're wording it a little differently than I had worded it. And, but, I, and I don't mean to do I, that, I'm but... I'm saying, you're talking to me about the race card. This race card is not a conversation that uh, I heard Mark Furman speak of. It's no. something I've heard the media speak of, and I'm saying that the media has played it more than anybody. It was mm -hmm. the media that was writing how many blacks were on the jury. These are Americans. What difference should it make? These are the Americans. When this jury was in panel, the first thing, the thing that jumped out at you more than gender was race. And the media talked about it. They brought Mark Furman into this case, and I don't think anybody. Uh, you listen to Marsha Clark's closing arguments. I don't think there's anybody, including the prosecution, that doesn't think that this man is a racist. The prosecution knows it. Listen to Marsha's words and closing arguments. Yet they still, uh, when you put a witness on the stand, my lawyers told me, you're vouching for that witness. We had many witnesses that we wanted to put on that uh, stand because they had what we thought positive information for me, but we couldn't vouch for them 100%. Mm -hmm. We could not vouch for them. We didn't put them on the stand. They still put this man on the stand. You and your lawyers, though, put that jury together. You were as much a part of it, and I'm sure race came into play didn't it? Oh, obviously, I think uh, you have to look both at sides, it. if you look at uh, the idea when they were dropping people, the prosecution started first. Mm -hmm. I think probably of their first eight or nine people, seven or eight of them were black, yeah. you know, and then obviously we sort of caught up. Uh, what did you at want? One point. What, did, what kind of a jury did you want? Did you want a, a, a black jury, Me? primarily black jury? jury? I wanted a fair jury. I, I would have said, that. at the time, though, I was a little more... Uh, my eyes may have been open a little more to how much race uh, was impacting um, the, the, the perception of this case. Uh, I may not have said that right. What I mean to say is in August, long before there were any evidence presented in this case, when you look at the hearing, the, the 911 call, uh, calls, the buying a knife at a knife store and all that, none of that came into really came into the case, you know. Mm -hmm. But still, 70 to 80 percent of white America had already convicted me. I find that so ironic, so hypocritical for them. That same group of people criticizing this jury, they say they only took two hours, uh, three hours to come to a verdict. That's not enough time. Yet, before there was a jury, before any evidence was presented in court, 80 percent of, from the polls, I don't always believe the polls, but 80 percent of white America, based on the polls, already had me guilty. And how, how can they say, you know, this jury listened to all the evidence. They didn't hear spin every night. Mm -hmm. and they didn't sit there and see what Geraldo or somebody wanted you to hear about the trial. You know, the jury sat there and heard every bit of evidence. And, you know, I'm, I'm from the sports world. Mm -hmm. The world I'm from, and, and I give speeches, and I've given speeches for 30 years. Everyone who's ever heard me speak, many of them, I always say accept responsibility for yourself. It's, it has some religious overtones because those words came to me in a chapel service in Boston once. I tell people, don't blame your teacher if you're not getting good grades. Don't blame your coach if you're not uh, playing, or playing up to what you think your ability is. Yet, and I, you know, you can call it a simple analogy here, yet I watch the prosecution and people out there who didn't watch this trial want to blame the jury. An American jury of 12 of, their, of Americans, 12 people, we went through the most extensive idea, I think, in the history of, uh, of, of trials. We came yeah. up with 12 people who sat through that uh, nine months of what had to be agony. Sure. Yet, 
They couldn't prove a case. They were wrong to begin with. I was innocent to begin with. They were wrong. It came out. The people heard the evidence, came to that conclusion, at least not guilty. Is this your heart talking that they came to not guilty because of the evidence or because of race? Because I, there I are some. The evidence. I'm not going to buy into this race. There are some who thing. believe that they did it because they were they were fighting for a brother. Fighting for a brother. You know, you tell those people. You go out into whatever neighborhood you want to get, and you show me a person that buy that, and you take them downstairs in every urban community in this country: Washington D.C., Chicago, Atlanta, New York City. You'll see, in most cases, most cases. The majority, certainly more than that, what is indicative in our population, the majority of jurors are black and now go to jail and see how many blacks are on, on death row. The majority of people on death row are probably black or Hispanic. See, that's total BS. You know, everybody's looking for an excuse not to face the facts. They want to blame the jury. They want to blame black people that were on that jury. Just go into the prisons a day and see how many blacks are in prison. And you go into any courtroom in this country in urban communities, you look at the most serious crimes, you look at the jury, you see black people putting black people in jail daily. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little pissed. That's okay. You're speaking your mind, I assume. No. Well, you know, I, it's, I, I've never accepted excuses in my day. Every person, when you talk about these incidents in my life, the 911 call, whatever, no one, no the police officer ever walked up to me didn't say, hey, he made no excuses. He accepted the responsibility. I've done that my entire life. And I'm watching people here trying to judge me who won't take the responsibility, who won't listen to facts, who who get these skewered opinions that they get on TV, who made up their mind before any evidence was in this case, and then they're gonna criticize people. I hear Goldman, who I have a lot of compassion for, because mm -hmm. I know how he feels. Mm -hmm. I lost more than he lost. I lost someone I loved just as much as he loved, and I lost my life for the most part. I'm a little stronger than most people think. I'm not sitting in this house trying to commit suicide, which we'll get to. I'm not sitting around crying the blues uh, uh, about what's been going on. Hey, I'm trying to stand tall, and I'm going to fight what I have to fight. I see he go on TV. I don't know what the man's talking about. He wants 10-2. Hey, I got to tell you, I felt 10-2. Uh, even before this trial happened, I felt that to get 12 people to go one way would be difficult, that they should go to 10-2 or 9-3. 10-2, you're talking about conviction 10-2 in the jury. Conviction yeah. in the jury. I, I, I was a believer in that. I see him go on TV. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, one of the in my case, if it was 10-2, I would have been acquitted in 20 minutes instead of three hours. One of the things he wants, he says, is justice, and he wanted you to take the stand and said that you're a coward for not taking the well, witness stand. Well, he couldn't buy justice. I didn't need to take the witness stand. I have a constitutional right. I wanted to take the witness stand. I would love to sit down with Marsha Clark. I would love to sit down with Goldman. I would rather Goldman and Marsha Clark to be sitting right here uh, uh, interviewing me, but they're too busy making money. You know, they don't want to see OJ try to replenish what he lost. I've, I'm the only person that lost anything financially, me and the taxpayers of this state. I don't see anybody trying to pay the taxpayers or me back. You know, that's all I want to do. I would have loved for Marsha Clark. Tomorrow, if Marsha Clark would sit down and, and talk to me, she can film it as long as I can market it. She can film it and ask me whatever she wants to ask me, and I'll answer every question. Why? Fred why Goldman, let him sit down. He can ask me whatever he wants to ask me. But I'm the only person at law. I'm not out there at this point asking the public to send me money. I'm well, not doing that. Why should I you be able to get make back. money off the tragedy? I'm not of making Ron money Goldman. off of tragedy. What tragedy am I making money off? That's what people will life, say, O.J. They'll say you're making money off of this now. Oh, the same people who had me uh, convicted, the same people who had me guilty in August of 94. What do they say about Marsha Clark? What do they say about Denise Brown? What do they talk about Faye Resnick? They'll find one thing that they go to and say, I'm not making money for being here tonight. They'll show that on TV. I tell you what. Let's take a look at Faye Rusnick and Denise Brown's tax returns for the last 10 years and their tax return for this past year. Let's see who's benefiting from this tragedy. Let's take a look at Marsha Clark, who I see has just gotten 42 years of salary. Mm -hmm. 42 years of salary with a book deal. Plus, she's probably going to equal that in her appearance. I don't begrudge her that. I don't begrudge her that, but I begrudge the hypocrites, the hypocrisy that says OJ is making money on this tragedy. No, I'm just trying to replenish what I lost. And you want to hear from me? Hey, you don't have to buy the tape. You know, if you want to hear from me, I'm here to speak. I got two kids, four kids, but two kids that I am the sole uh, supporter of, financial supporter of. 
the Browns have given them love, have maintained what Nicole and I had given those kids. Those were happy kids when they got them. They're happy kids today. I will always be grateful to the Browns for maintaining what Nicole and I had instilled in our kids. But every month I send a check down there for my kids. Yet I got people out here that are saying that as an American, I can't go out and make money. I was real willing to do an interview free. Those same people were picketing outside of the, the network to keep me from doing it free. This is not about making money. This is about what I consider prejudice, prejudice against my rights as an American to earn a living and support my family. You can hear the helicopters oh. overhead. You're a prisoner here. Good time. No, You're I'm a, not prisoner a prisoner here. I am not a prisoner here. I go out, I go out, I go to dinners, I read where the rags, once again, I read where, oh, you went the to tabloids? this restaurant, the tabloids, and they, they throw these uh, napkins. I've never been in a restaurant. The restaurant that they said that uh, I've never been in, in every restaurant I've been in mm -hmm. since I've been out, the managers have been courteous. They've been encouraging. They asked me to come back. I've had a great meal. Uh, if I walk out here, if I've seen a thousand people outside of my house, 995 of those people, white women mm -hmm. from, from Iowa, from Georgia, from Canada, from South Africa even, have all been encouraging, telling me to keep my head up. You know, get your kids, go on. So you with believe your life. there are people who believe in you? Oh, yeah, I got over two million pieces of mail from people that I've. Uh, that, yeah. that have sent mail to my house and my office that totally believe in me and, and many people that when I was in Panama City the people were so so encouraging down there it was, it was just mind boggling I, I'm aware of a, of a, of a tabloid mm -hmm. show giving a lady a sign, we have eight witnesses to this mm -hmm. gave her a sign, had her drive by go away OJ with the sign and that was the story they got across the country you know? The day the verdict was read um, and, and you were set free there were some people who said it was in very bad taste. Um, I don't know if this happened again. This may be tabloid. This may be reports. Mm. Toasting champagne, celebrating victory, celebrating vindication. Mm. Knowing that, uh, at least in your mind, the real killers of Nicole were still out there somewhere. Hey, the real killers had been out there for a year and four months. This was, friends, there was nothing planned. Excuse me. There was absolutely nothing planned. I came home to a relatively empty house. I walked through the front door, I saw my long-term assistant Kathy Rander and Al Cowlings, mm -hmm. uh, I think Nicole Povers, who was my jailhouse uh, liaison, uh, lawyer, uh, up the front. I walked into this room and stood almost where we're, where we're sitting now, and they pretty much left me alone. Mm -hmm. uh, phone calls were coming that I wasn't taking, a couple of calls I did take from real close friends. I think because of the media outside, people saw I was home and friends began, began to come over. Uh, some friends uh, sent um, food here, and it, it was such a spontaneous thing. You saw blooms and flowers coming. The majority of those blooms and flowers were coming from my neighbors. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the neighborhood. That's not the report you got uh, from the media. And so it was a total spontaneous thing. And you know what we ended up doing? Mm -hmm. That I, they may have written, written someplace, but I really hadn't read it, and I didn't read a lot about uh, what transpired that week. I was focusing on my kids and adjusting. You know what we did? We stood in the other room, packed with people, I, probably 50 or 100 people, I don't know. We spoke, we prayed, and we sung religious songs. That's not the image the press gave America, though, did they? They gave champagne and partying and dancing, no. We sung religious songs. We prayed together as a group. That's what we did in this house that day. Yes, there was a, a jubilant feeling. I was home. Yes. And I felt it to an extent. I was still No apologies numb. for that. Huh? Absolutely none. None. Do you think, I mean, I'm looking at Denise Brown and Faye Russell going to parties, starting love affairs, going out of love. Why, why shouldn't they have the right to do that? Yeah. Why shouldn't they have the right? I see Denise Brown in court to testify for her sister's death, slipping a number to Tony the Animal somebody, right? I mean, I don't see anybody criticizing that. I don't, well, you, know, I, I, you know, picking up a guy at her sister's, her ex-brother-in-law's trial for the murder of her sister? Picking a guy up under those circumstances and I'm being criticized because friends are here praying with me, singing songs that I'm home that I've been, in my mind and in their mind, vindicated. Doesn't, doesn't wash with you. Doesn't wash with me at all. If you didn't do this horrible crime, who did? 
Who killed Nicole? Who killed Ron Goldman? I wouldn't be sitting here with you now if I knew. I will say this. I have absolutely no doubt. I think if you talk to some people who have been close to Nicole the last four years, they feel the same way, that the answer is somewhere in the world of Faye Rusnick. No doubt. You talk about coincidences. How much of a coincidence is it that roughly 10 days before Nicole's death, uh, I'm on the phone with Faye Rusness. She's crying to me, yeah. begging me to talk to her boyfriend to marry her. Yeah. A guy who is a great guy, Kristen Reichardt. Kristen Reichardt. Nobody has anything bad to say about Kristen. Impeccable record, great guy. Yeah. Kristen couldn't do it because she had problems. She moved out of that house, moved in with Nicole for the weekend. I don't know how long she had moved in. Just yeah. Nicole, she was a friend, Nicole brought her in. Four days later, even though Nicole often complained and knew all about this woman's drug problems, Nicole saw fit to call friends together to put this girl away because it was totally to have an intervention. She was totally out of control with it. Nicole called her friends mm -hmm. together. The next day, they put this woman in a in a in a rehab center. Three days after that, uh, Sydney Brooke, my daughter stated that probably the last time she heard her mother, her mother was crying, you know. We know now that that was in all likelihood Faye Rusnick who claims that Nicole was giggling. This woman is in a rehab center. Nicole wouldn't be on the phone with her giggling and any mother out there that got an eight-year-old daughter, you, your daughter know if you're crying or if you're giggling. My daughter, Sydney, is a sharp girl. She knows if her mother is dying or, or, or giggling, or crying rather, or giggling, and within hours of this Nicole's dead. Now what happens after this? This woman claims that she was fearing for her life from AC and Bob Shapiro, for God's sake. She runs away. She runs and goes into hiding and begins to spin her yarn. And hey, we can go through her story. Sure, you're going to hear a lot about this in this civil trial and obviously some other civil trials. You think I had a dream team before. Wait till you see my litigators with the tabloids and people like Faye Rusnick. Uh, this woman flat out lied. I'm, I'm calling her a liar. Her book, I can show you, it's provable. The prosecution's are lied. Her best, what she claimed to be her best friend is murdered. If she know nothing about it, why does she have to lie? Go to Cora Fishman, Nicole's best friend. Nobody doubts that. Mm -hmm. Nicole spent more time with Cora Fishman than any other person other than her kids and maybe me from time to time in the last four years of her life. Find out if the things that this girl have said about Nicole are true. This girl just lied and lied and lied. And I asked myself, why? If you're innocent, if you don't know nothing, why do you run and hide and say your life is in danger? And why do you lie time and time again? And it hurts me because I wasn't speaking to Nicole in the end because of Faye Rusnick. Because Faye Rusnick asked me, wanted to know why she wasn't invited to an affair that I had invited Christian and Dr. Fishman and his son to. And I hadn't mm -hmm. invited the girls because they're Nicole's friends. And I was going to be with Paula Barbieri, Faye Rusnick, Christian was there, said, I want to go. Hey, we don't play that. We love you, OJ. We love Nicole. I want to get to know Paula. I want to get to know Nicole's, whoever she ends up with. I invite her. Nicole calls me and screams at it's, me because mm -hmm. Faye tells her a total different story. When I asked Faye, what, what, didn't you tell her you, were in, you invited yourself? She said, oh, come on, OJ. This is a week before her murder. Mm -hmm. Come on, OJ. Nicole loves you. You're back with Paula. She loves you. I say, Faye, do me a favor. Call Nicole and tell her you insisted on going to this affair. Now, that's not the story you've been getting from Faye Rusnick, is it? But fortunately for me, there were witnesses to all of this. Again, it's, you, well, first of all, you don't have any proof that Faye Rusnick was involved. Oh, it's like, I, who, what proof right. that I murdered anybody? I mean, everybody, we could, well, you can use the same circumstantial evidence for Faye Rusnick. We can look in her past. Mm -hmm. and we find out that anything remotely like this might have happened in uh, San Francisco. Did she ever leave the country before because of something that might have happened? I don't know. Why don't we take a look at these investigative uh, journalists out there, uh, these tabloid shows. Why don't we go and take a look at it? Why don't we just go and see? Or the police. Why don't we or the police. I ask you a what, question. Why? Have you seen anywhere, have you seen written anywhere where Marsha Clark, Phil Van Adder, Phillips, uh, Darden, anybody ever asked Faye Rusnick who delivered her drugs? We know she was broke. That's, mm -hmm. Everybody knows she was broke. 
We know it's expensive to do the type of things that she uh, was doing at the time, allegedly, but they had an intervention. Evidently, she admitted it. Nicole took them to her stash. Mm -hmm. I got a question. Did they ever ask the question? Did anybody deliver you drugs this week? I'm not aware of it, but again. Uh, but this is the most thoroughly investigated case of all time, yes. This is your contention, that she was, she and Ron Goldman, Nicole and Ron Goldman, I don't were know killed, about Ron Goldman. I, but they were killed accidentally, I don't in know. a sense. I don't know. I can't talk about that. I, I have absolutely no idea. I know Nicole is a confrontational person. She always has been. She's been confrontational with house help. I noticed that the rags hadn't gone to all the housekeepers and all the nannies who've worked in this house. All of them will give you a totally different story. Mm -hmm. And many of them have, even in Europe, who live in Europe now. I've given you a totally different story than what the tabloids have been mm -hmm. telling you about my relationship with Nicole and who was aggressive and who was not aggressive uh, uh, in this household. I don't, I, I don't know. I just know if someone came to that house looking for Faye, doing whatever, mm -hmm. Nicole would have been very confrontational, would have, because that was her nature. Well, I knew that we would never have enough time to talk about everything yeah. in, in 90 minutes, approximately. It's frustrating let, for me because I try to say everything. Let me do one and, thing, though, and, and this, we can talk for hours, we can talk about evidence, people will still have questions, they'll have their own opinions. Let me look directly into the eyes of O.J. Simpson. Like so many people watching this tape are doing right this minute and say to you, did you kill Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman? Absolutely not. I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't do it. You know, one of the things that probably saved my life when I was in that orange grove was that my mother always told me that people who commit suicide can't go to heaven. I expect, hopefully, I pray that one day I'll see Nicole again. I have no doubt that's where she is. I couldn't kill anybody. No matter what you no say or do. What, you no know, matter what you say or do, though, there are people that they'll, are they'll not going to believe you. They'll, they'll believe it, you know, and hey, I can't help that. I can just say to them, look at my history. Not the history that a Tammy Bruce is trying to create. But let's look at the facts. People lived in this house. Go to all the people who ever lived with Nicole and I. Mm -hmm. Go to all of her friends. You know, go to Nicole's words and things like her divorce deposition or these spontaneous utterances that she made at the 911 call where there was absolutely nothing in 93 physical that happened between us. You go to all of these people uh, and find out. See the nature of me. I can tell you honestly that other than my 89 thing with Nicole, once on a football field with Mel Lunksford, Mel, sorry to bring your name up, I had a fight with a guy named Mel Lunksford on the football field three, four inches taller than I, 50 pounds heavier than I. I can tell you in my adult life, I never had a fight with anybody. Everybody got along with me. Everyone who's ever worked in this house would tell you, if anything, I was a peacemaker in this house. My history, you talk about my history, that is my history. You talk to people who live with me, you talk to people who work with me, you talk to people in my public. That was my history. I didn't get into confrontations. You know, I've had my arguments with Nicole. And Nicole has had her arguments with many people, with house help, with her mother. But Nicole was a strong woman, and she, I can tell you this, I say this without any reservation. I think if you go to any friend of hers, somebody like Tammy Bruce, Nicole would punch her. <laughs> Nicole would punch her right in her she face. She could push your buttons, too, couldn't she, O.J.? Oh, Nicole. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, she could. But not Do you know anybody that's been with a woman for, for 15, 17 years that the woman couldn't push his buttons? But not enough to kill her? Not enough not to get enough, that angry? Not enough, really, to, to hit her or to purposely injure her. Never. Even in 89, my, pro my, my goal in 89 was just to get her out of my bedroom, not to hurt her. You're the only one who knows, really, the truth of what no, you're No, no, there's somebody else that knows the truth. Who's that? It's, uh, the person who killed them. Yeah. You can live with yourself? <sighs> yes. I think I've been a good guy. I think I've been a good person. I think my life has shown it. I believe in God. God has been with me. He's made me strong. I hope even today, I, I kind of, there's things I don't like what I said today because I, I don't want to go to certain people's levels. And today I think I did. Uh, but I've had so much in me, so much stored in me, there's so much more that I want to say. And I kind of apologize if I got a little carried away there. But that's me. That's anybody who's ever played golf with me. Everybody who knows me know that. I'm not a guy, I say what's on my mind, everybody knows where they stand with me, and I like to think I've been supportive of everybody, even people who have been critical of me 
uh, virtually every one of them, I can tell you a time, and they would agree that they came to me for help when they were in women, friends of Nicole's, who I think probably feel that I'm guilty, that when they were at places in their lives where, when even Nicole wouldn't speak to them, who you ask Chris Jenner, uh, they came to me, and I was there for them. You didn't kill her? No, I did not kill anybody. I could not and would not. Thank you for your time, yeah. Andre. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Now, this is the uh, Rockingham Gate to my home. It's west of the house. Uh, we actually use it as an exit. And it was on this street, Rockingham, that Allen Park drove uh, up that night of the 12th. And uh, Allen Park was pretty consistent in his testimony, and as well as uh, what he told the police in the first interview that he did uh, throughout the trial. And Marsha Clark was almost as consistent with her misrepresentation of this uh, person's um, um, uh, testimony. And it seems strange to me that the, that the press or many of the pundits around the country chose to go with Marsha's misrepresentations instead of uh, Alan Park's actual testimony. One thing Alan said was when he drove up this street, he didn't notice any cars on Rockingham and he did not notice a Bronco. He didn't notice it when he drove up. He didn't notice it at one point when he drove down the middle of the street. Curiously, not along the curb when he wanted to look through this gate to see if he can see anyone in my house. I submit that uh, he rode, came back in the middle of the street because the Bronco would have blocked him riding along the curb. But he also, more importantly, stated that he didn't notice this Bronco when he drove out of the Rockingham gate at a time when I think everybody agreed that the Bronco was there. I find very interesting that uh, if this Bronco was parked askew, as the police uh, time and time again stated. Now, you look at this parking job. I mean, you would, you, you'd have to be, I mean, with the parking police to say that this is a bad parking job. This is a truck, and I submit it'd be pretty difficult to drive up and uh, park a car much better than this parking job. A couple of other points about this Bronco is that uh, uh, a lot of talk about the mixed blood stains that were, were on the console. You realize there was only seven-tenths of one drop of blood on that console. I can literally sneeze in my hand, rub it around that console, and you would probably have more DNA. Another uh, incident that uh, came about because of the Bronco, and I found it very uh, indicative of everything that happened in this case and how members of the media and pundits around this country were so quick to jump on any negative, anything that may have made me look uh, more guilty. Uh, was this body bag, this plastic bag, and this shovel that they found uh, in the back of my Bronco. Now, they investigated this case for seven months, seven or eight months uh, before we got to trial. They said it was an exhaustive investigation. Yet, that Friday, they showed the jury, they sprang in front of the jury and the nation, this plastic bag, which they tried to imply uh, could have been used as a body bag, and this shovel that was in the back of my car. And of course, the media that weekend just went wild with it, and I would assume most of the people around the country who thought I was guilty say, see, what did I tell you? Well, over the weekend, they discovered that this plastic bag uh, came with every Bronco. It was standard equipment. It came, uh, it had something to do with the spare tire, and of course, the shovel was not a shovel that you would use to dig holes. It was a mucking shovel that you would use to uh, pick up stuff. In my case, uh, we call it a pooper scooper, and I actually had it in the back of my car because I was going over to Nicole's house. She was having some trouble with the neighbor to the north of her because the dogs were, you know, doing their do around there, and uh, this disgruntled ex-husband was going over there picking up uh, the dog do for her. Uh, let's go back in and some other interesting things that I can point out to you out here. Uh, some of it has to do with this driveway. Uh, before I show you some blood drops that were found uh, on the property, let's talk a little about uh, some of the evidence and things that came out in court. One that you cannot age blood drops. You can't really tell when they were deposited. For instance, uh, two blood drops were found here side by side and you really couldn't tell um, when, if they were deposited at the same time or not. Uh, one thing is curious to me that these were side by side, which would indicate someone was bleeding from two sides of their body, I guess. Uh, as we go down the driveway, we have cards where they found various blood drops. <laughs> 
Here's one here, and then there's other cards going towards uh, the front of the house. One thing that really jumps out at you is that none of these blood drops go in this direction to the side of the garage where Mark Furman allegedly found uh, the bloody glove. Some other points I should make about the blood. All the blood, the blood drops going along the side of Nicole's house towards her alley, uh, the blood drops that are on this uh, driveway um, going in various directions uh, to or from my front door, um, the blood splattered Bronco, my blood splattered home. All of this blood constitutes less than 15 drops of blood, less than 15 drops. Now, when you talk about the uh, estimated one and a half cc's of blood that was missing from the blood vial, that would constitute something like 30 drops of blood. And when you talk about that blood drop vial, Philip Van Adder, an experienced investigator, for the first time in his career, decided to bring the blood vial from downtown where he could have booked it out here to my home when he didn't even know if uh, Dennis Wong would still be here. I find that very unusual. Since we're out here, let's talk about some observations that Alan Park may have had. Uh, this is my car. It's a uh, Bentley. Uh, and I'm talking about Alan Park here. Alan Park, I felt, was an honest witness who just made some uh, honest observational mistakes. As we know, uh, his comments about the uh, Bronco on the street, he didn't notice it coming or going. He stated uh, that he felt that there were two cars parked here. Well, he was wrong. There was only one car parked here. Arnell, my daughter, didn't return home to about 1 o'clock that night, and I can only assume that his mistake came about because he saw pictures of, uh, that the prosecution took uh, when he was up in their office. I think Cato Kalin would tell you there were only one car parked here. I would go on to say that he was driving a stretch limo. Now, normally, if there were two cars parked here correctly, you cannot get a stretch limo through my driveway. It's just a little too tight uh, back there by the garage, and most uh, limo drivers that come here, if they're driving a stretch, they have to back in on Ashford and then drive out of Ashford. This is a picture that the prosecution took of my car and my daughter's car as they were parked that morning. Now, you couldn't even get a normal car around that curve uh, the way these two cars were parked. Another point I want to make about Alan Park, who once again I think was an honest witness. I just think he made a couple of honest observational mistakes. He was pretty vehement on the stand that the golf bag that we showed him in court was not the golf bag that I had. He did state that it was a Swiss Army knife golf bag, but this is not the bag, I think was his uh, exact words, and he was pretty vehement about that. Well, Swiss Army Knife only had a few golf bags. They had just recently sent me that golf bag uh, as a gift. It's the only golf bag that Swiss Army makes. There's no other. There could have been no other. So here's a guy who felt that he observed some things. Uh, he was wrong. He had no ax to grind one way or the other. I just feel it was an honest mistake. He was not a detective. He was here just to pick up a customer and take him to the airport. And there's no reason for him to you know, be tested uh, on his observational skills, and unfortunately, uh, he made a few mistakes. Now, since we're outside, let's go back to what I thought was uh, some of the more informative uh, uh, evidence that something funny went on during this investigation. I want you to assume that perhaps at some time, since 1985 or 6, you addressed a member of the African-American race as a nigger. Is it possible that you have forgotten that act on your part? No, it's not possible. Are you therefore saying that you have not used that word in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective? Yes, Fuller? they would. All of them, correct? All of them. All right. Was the testimony that you gave at the preliminary hearing in this case completely truthful? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Have you ever falsified a police report? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Is it your intention to assert your Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to all questions that I ask you? Yes. Uh, Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? 
I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. And let me come back to Mark Furman for a minute, just so it's clear. Did he lie when he testified here in this courtroom saying that he did not use racial epithets in the last 10 years? Yes. Is he a racist? Yes. Is he the worst LAPD has to offer? Yes. Do we wish that this person was never hired by LAPD? Yes. Should LAPD have ever hired him? No. Should such a person be a police officer? No. In fact, do we wish there were no such person on the planet? Yes. Now we're going to walk down the uh, alleyway, or I guess sidewalk, to the south of my house where Furman supposedly found the glove. First thing I want to draw your attention to is there's a door here that goes into my garage and then uh, goes in, you can go into my house that way. Obviously, if I had committed these murders and I was trying to get into my house undetected with a limo driver uh, with an un unobstructed view looking down my driveway, I could have gone through this door. The prosecution made a big deal about this door, saying there was a lot of stuff on the other side so that you couldn't get in this door. But as you can see, it opens outward, not inward. So it would have been no problem to go in there and negotiate some of the items that were on the other side uh, if I wanted to get into my house that night. Now, as we walk down this walkway, you'll see there's a lot of debris, and uh, I have old pavers here, some old bricks here. Um, one thing that's very interesting, there was no blood drops detected anywhere along this walkway. Here, let's take time and look at another door. This door goes into my washroom, uh, uh, which is obviously inside my house. If you recall, Darden was making a big deal about uh, some clothes that was in my washer, trying to imply they may have been mine. And in closer inspection, we saw that there were panties and things. They were my daughter's Arnell's clothes. And of course, that's another one of these uh, uh, theories or, or what they call Kodak moments in, in the trial that didn't go for the prosecution, that they thought uh, with all that investigation, they had figured something out. One thing you're going to see with all this dense foliage, it's a little thinner now than it was back then that runs along the side of uh, this house. There's a lot of berries. These berries from these Eugenia plants, uh, they were all over the floor of this uh, walkway. Once again, there was no blood going down here. You see the thickness of the uh, foliage here. It would have been pretty difficult to come over this, this, this wall, this fence. If you take a good look at this fence also, you'll see that it's sort of tied off at the top. Uh, and it's pretty sharp here at the top, and you would think that anyone who was trying to come over this uh, fence could have had some problems with uh, hurting themselves on this wire, and of course there was no uh, blood. You would imagine this person was covered in blood. There'd be some blood or some fibers or something there. Here we have this air conditioning unit, which we've heard a lot about. Uh, once again, when I was talking about that A&E two-hour special that I saw the other night on the trial, and Bill Curtis made a point there saying this was a unit that Cato Kalin heard three loud thumps from. Well, Cato Kalin at no time in this trial said that he heard three loud thumps from the air conditioning unit. Once again, that was one of Marsha Clark's theories. Uh, she said that. What Cato actually said, and he demonstrated when he was on the stand with the, with the table in front of him, that he heard three loud bumps, sort of like that. I don't know what that could have been. Maybe it was a signal. I have no idea. But he never said that he heard anyone hit this air conditioning unit. That was a theory of Marsha Clark's. Now, let's take a good look at this air conditioning unit. You can see there's some slats here. They face outward. It's head high. So one would think if anyone ran back here in the dark and ran into this uh, unit that they would should, should have sustained some type of bruise, some type of injury. And of course, if they were bloodied and had blood on them, uh, there should have been some fabric or some blood on that unit. Right down here, about four or five feet from this unit is where they found or where they claim to have found uh, the glove. Uh, one very interesting thing about that glove, there was no debris on it, there was a lot more here then than there is now, and one key thing about that glove, when Furman saw it, he said it was still wet, it was thick, we did some experiments with that with experts, and they all told you that there was no possible way, seven hours later after this crime, that that glove could still have, bloody, uh, have blood on it, could still be wet and still be bloody. That was, I think, an experiment that... I can't recall now if we really got it into evidence or not, but uh, we know, and the public should know, that that was an experiment that was done, and it proved that 
that glove should have been dried uh, by that time in the morning. Now, let's go around front again, and I'll show you some more interesting things. One other point I should say, once again, these berries that were here were also at Nicole's house. If someone walked out of that or walked away to the side of her house, and if they went uh, into that Bronco, there should have been some debris, some leaves, some berries. The same should uh, have been detected in my home. I have some very light carpeting, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, if someone ran through here and then went right into my house and went up that carpeting, stepping on these berries, one would think there'd be some trace of that on this very light carpeting. Let's go around front. Mm -hmm. Before we go into my uh, foyer and talk about more of the uh, so-called blood evidence, uh, uh, since we're out here, let me cover a few things that sort of came into the, the trial that... There was a little car sarcasm about me hitting golf balls. Uh, uh, shortly after I got home, I would say uh, 10 o'clock, a little after 10 o'clock, I came out here. I was actually looking for a sand wedge. I had recently got some new clubs, uh, Callaway Big Bertha irons, and I didn't like their sand wedge, and I wanted to go back to my old Callaway sand wedge. I also wanted to change my three wood. I'd gone into my garage, and I'd gotten an old three wood, a Wood Brothers, a sort of a custom-made club, even though the head was kind of beat up. I walked out here to my Bentley. I opened the trunk up where I had a lot of golf clubs, which the police had confiscated at some later time. And I couldn't find my sand wedge, and I took a pitching iron. I was uh, looking for some balls. I play with a ball called Max Fly 100. I had no new Max Fly balls, even though I have a closet full of other balls that I'd never used. But I did have a couple of bags of balls in the trunk of my car, balls that I had already used. Normally, I play two sleeves of balls per round of golf. So some of the balls that I would throw away, uh, other people uh, would think were great golf balls. I went through that bag and uh, tried to pick some unscuffed balls. I picked about five or six unscuffed balls. I put them in a little bag that I had in the trunk of my car that had a, a windbreaker in it, a Hertz windbreaker in it. I put those balls in that bag. I took the uh, pitching wig and I took about four or five other balls and I walked over here. I dropped the bag right around here, a bag incidentally we brought into the courtroom, but since Alan Park claimed he never saw that uh, bag and couldn't identify it, uh, Judge Ito wouldn't allow us to put it into evidence. But anyway, I brought four or five balls, scuff balls, drop them here. Normally I have a net here that my son uh, Justin will hit balls into, and I do a lot of chipping around here. And I began to chip those five or six balls away. Uh, I chipped a couple of them over into the sand, and I actually chipped, uh, hit a full hit, and hit one over this tree onto Mrs. Neverker's property, which is across Ashford. Uh, curiously enough, the uh, police found some golf balls the next uh, day. You never saw that in evidence, though, but I saw it in one of their discovery property reports. They found some of those golf balls. I actually sculled one, hit some of the playground equipment, and I had recently gotten all the dents out of my car. I was cringing trying to figure out where that ball uh, had gone. At that point, I walked back to my uh, Bentley. I put the club back in my Bentley. I actually left both the white bag as well as the other bag down here. No one ever mentions that white bag. We'll get to that a little uh, later. And I then walked out and looked into my back of my uh, uh, Bronco to see if I had any clubs there. And my dog was out. We ended up walking back into my uh, Ashford gate because I normally keep one of the gates uh, on a hinge. And then I went into the house. Now, hitting golf balls took all of two minutes, all of about two minutes at the most. And I may have been outside. Uh, between trying to find the club in the trunk of my car, being in my uh, garage, picking balls that were unscuffed, uh, coming over here, hitting golf balls, looking into my Bronco and walking back into my house. No more than 10 minutes that whole period of time. And at the same time, he said almost simultaneously, he saw a person approximately six feet tall, 200 pounds, African-American wearing all dark clothing walking at a good pace up the driveway. Now at the same time that you saw Cato Kalin in the side yard, did you see anything else? Yes, I saw a, uh, a figure come down, well not come down, but I saw a figure come into the uh, entranceway of the house just about where the, where the driveway starts. Can you show us on this uh, diagram where you first saw that person? Uh, 
Uh, just if you go where the circle is, you go straight back. No, the other way. A uh, little bit farther. It was about there. Around that area. As I walk down my driveway, as you can see, it's easy to see me. Alan Park testified on the stand that he had a, a view from the end of my garage right up here, actually to the front of my house. And this is, uh, I guess, represents some of the uh, biggest frustration I had, not only during the trial, but after the trial, when Marshall Clark tried to create some impressions that fortunately the jury didn't buy it. Unfortunately, the pundits bought it. They sold it to you and a lot of people out there. I, See, in interviews that we do on Man on the Street, they ask this question. You notice that Ross Becker asked me, who was the shadowy figure that came across the driveway? Bill Curtis, who did a very fine two hours on A&E, even felt, uh, I asked a question at one point about a shadowy figure coming down the driveway or across the lawn and entered the house. One guy even said, who was the guy Alan Park saw climb the wall? The facts are, Nobody, at no time I should say, did Allen Park uh, indicate that he saw anybody climb the wall, come down a driveway, cross a lawn, or even come across uh, the uh, driveway. That was a figment of Marsha Clark's, uh, in her mind, and she tried to sell that to you, and unfortunately a lot of you people uh, bought that. What Allen Park testified to, that there was a person that was right about here. He put an X on an exhibit to prove it. Right here was where my golf bags were placed, where I walked out of my house put my suit bag down, looked into my golf bag. When he was let into my property by Cato Kalin and they arrived here, right here was a suit bag, which Alan Park thought was a duffel bag. As we know now, it was a suit bag. Uh, later on, you saw me on the plane and got off the plane with it. And my golf bag, that's all he saw. In the, in the time he arrived here was 10.20. I guess he was here until after 11 o'clock. That is the only activity outside of my house that he witnessed. Now let's go inside. How much blood did you withdraw from Mr. Simpson? Uh, approximately eight cc's. You say approximately. You did not measure the amount? Well, it could have been 7.9 or it could have been 8.1. And, and uh, I just looked at the syringe and looked at, at about eight cc's. I withdrew the needle from his arm. Nobody asked you to take a precise amount no. of blood? And you did not record the amount of blood you took? No. It's just routinely, uh, that's about the amount I usually draw. And you do this on a routine basis every day? Do you do this every day in the jail, take blood? Oh, whenever, not for this sort of thing, it's usually for alcohol, blood alcohol. But you do take blood on a yes. regular basis, and you take the same amount of blood? Yes. <coughs> Another test tube kept putting in water until it looked approximately as to what I had drawn. I measured that, and that was about six and a half cc's. So I estimated that that's what I really had drawn. Had drawn. So, after you had done this, what conclusion did you come to? I came to the conclusion that I was wrong in the statement I made, that I didn't <coughs> draw ACC, so that I drew about six to six and a half. I just looked at the syringe, and it looked at about eight cc's. That was a that statement, which I shouldn't have made. I looked at it, I should have said it looked like it was enough, which it was enough. Yeah. I, uh, eight cc's, I just... I was wrong in that eight cc's altogether. How many times have you taken blood from Parker Center out to a crime scene? I don't know. This may have been the first time. I don't know. I can't recall right now any other times that I've done that. So, now you're saying that Mr. Simpson's gray manila envelope with the blood sample in it was put into that black past plastic trash bag that Ms. Mazzola was carrying? To the best of my recollection, yes. And uh, did you place it in the trash bag in her sight, in her presence? I don't think so. I don't recall. You just said, I don't think so, and then you said, I don't recall. That's right. 
you told us that one would expect that SWAT, these swatches, having been put in a test tube at 6.30 p.m. on June 13th and removed at 7.30 a.m. on June 14th, to be dry. Yes. Given that fact, given that opinion, given that opinion, what is your opinion about the existence of these transfer stains? Overall. The only opinion I can give in under this circumstance, something wrong. No further questions, Your Honor. Well, as I enter the foyer of my house, we're going to go back and talk about blood drops. Uh, I think it should be noted that at no time did they count the swatches that they used to collect these blood drops at Bundy, uh, in the driveway here, or anywhere in this case. Uh, and the next day when they processed these blood drops or these swatches, uh, they did it in the same area that they had my uh, reference vial. And I'm told by DNA experts that that is a no-no. Now, if you come down here, I'm going to place this picture down at this spot here. This picture shows three blood drops that uh, they said that they found in my foyer right about this spot. Uh, as you can see by my thumbnail, uh, which is bigger than these pegs, that these are pretty small uh, drops. And I believe it was Michael Batten that, that uh, testified that that would be indicative of a small paper cut, certainly not of a big cut. Uh, I think we should also point out that it was in this area that Detective uh, Van Adder claimed that he turned over my reference bile to Dennis Fung. Now, uh, I guess it was in a garbage bag or something, and they gave that to Andrea Mazzola, who took it out, even though they never told her that a reference bile was in that bag. Uh, when Andrea Mazzola was asked, did you see this exchange take place, uh, she testified that for that one minute, we call it the Mazzola minute, she went into the other room, sat on the couch, and closed her eyes. Huh? sort of a variation on see no evil and hear no evil. Uh, incidentally, they checked all of these items, the doorknob, the light switches, as we move over to my staircase, the rug, my banister, checked all of these items for blood, and of course, no blood found. And if you look at this uh, carpeting, it's a little more plush than the carpeting that was in my Bronco. Those Bruno Magli shoes had some ridges in them. You would have thought that if there was some blood in there anywhere, that uh, this carpeting would have picked up some of it, and of course it didn't. Now let's go up to my bedroom. In Mr. Simpson's master bedroom area, did you see someone walking around with a videotape camera? I don't recall when I saw the videotape camera coming through. I do recall it being there, though. You recall... Uh, a gentleman named Mr. Ford, do you know him? Yes, I do. African-American gentleman? Yes. And he was the one that was carrying around the video camera? Yes. You have no recollection whatsoever of them, of Mr. Ford, with the video camera, up in the master bedroom, at or around the time that you were doing collection? Again, I didn't keep track of Mr. Ford at that time. Have you seen that videotape? No, I have not. Have you had discussions with anybody about that videotape? No. Have you had any discussions with people at SID about what's shown on that videotape? No. Have you had discussions with anyone in the district attorney's office as to what's shown on that videotape? No. Has anybody anywhere communicated to you anything about whether or not at 4.14 in the afternoon those socks are depicted on that videotape. No one has communicated that information to me or with me. Has anybody indicated to you there's some question as to whether or not those socks are on the videotape? So I believe it was your testimony on direct examination <coughs> that you collected the socks sometime between 4.30 and 4.40. About then, yes. And then before you left the residence, you collected two other items, numbers 15 and 16, and those were at 5 and 505. And then we come to those socks. Those socks. They just don't fit. They just don't fit. They just don't fit. Watch with me now a video 
I want you to watch the time counter in this time frame. And you'll understand how important this is. This is Mr. Willie Ford going up into the bedroom. It's 3.13, which he says is 4.13, because it hadn't been changed. This is 4.13 p.m. on June 13, 1994. Okay, thank you, Howard. If you look at the foot of the bed there, where the socks are supposed to be, you'll see no socks in this video. And you'll recall that Mr. Willie Ford testified about this. And I asked him, well, well where, where are the socks, Mr. Ford? I didn't see any socks. So now, that's interesting, isn't it? At 4.13, on June 13th, 1994, these socks, they supposedly recover. These mysterious socks. These socks that no one sees any blood on until August 4th, all of a sudden. These socks that are picked up, that Looper says he picks them up because they just look out of place. I don't have any reason to pick them up. I'll just take these socks. They're out of place. Well, as I come up my stairs, white carpeting all the way, banister, they checked everything and no blood. Now, come with me into my bedroom. Now, this is my bedroom. Incidentally, I believe this is a book that every American should read. This is the room and this is the area, basically, where the police claim to have found the socks. Even they admit that these socks seem somewhat out of place. What's interestingly, uh, interesting about that is a videographer named uh, Willie Ford, a police officer, was here at 413. He photographed the entire room. He didn't see any socks. No one told him to try to avoid stepping on any socks. And if you look at that video, what I find very curious is the video goes right up to the point where you would see the socks. The video goes off, and about four or five feet beyond that, the video begins again. So just that crucial area where the socks would have been, you don't see. What's key about Willie Ford being here at 413 is Andrea Mazzola and Dennis Fong in their log show that they collected the socks after 430. After 430. Where were those socks when uh, Willie Ford was in this room? Another point I'd like to make about this videographer. Uh, throughout this trial, we asked for film. Was there any film taken? This is for you pundits and you people out there that say the police won't cover up and they're forthcoming all the time. We asked on TV, in the courtroom, out of the courtroom, time and time again, where were there any film? Were there any videographer here? Uh, was there any film taken? And they denied it. They denied it. They denied it. Uh, Willie Ford is a Afro-American or African-American, a big man with a video camera. I, 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 I find it hard to believe that you can miss this guy. Now, months and months later, we're looking at some still pictures. And lo and behold, what do we see in one of these still pictures? A picture of a videographer, Willie Ford, in this house taking pictures. Now, I submit to you, there are police all over this house, all over the place. There were police officers who directed this man on what pictures to take, what pictures not to take. We're on national TV time and again. We made requests for, was there any video taken? Were there any film taken at these scenes? And the police denied it. They denied it. They denied it, even though obviously many of them knew there was some video taken. Uh, their excuse was a police officer said he threw it in his draw and he forgot about it. He forgot about it. One other point before I leave my bedroom. Now, this is my bedroom. As you notice, it faces east. It faces my uh, swimming pool and my tennis court, and the entry to my house is to the west. Now, perceptions in this case has uh, really had an interesting effect on the public and on the pundits. Uh, uh, I think it was Alan Park that mentioned that uh, when he drove up, he couldn't see any lights on in my house. And of course, uh, Marsha Clark took that, as she does often, and uh, before the trial was over, uh, it was uh, a definitive. There was no lights on in his house. Tom Brokaw found that very interested, interesting, rather, because he stated uh, after our aborted interview, my aborted interview with uh, NBC, that that was a question he wanted to ask me. Why were you uh, getting dressed in the dark? There was no lights on uh, in the house. And I want to show you something to, uh, to answer that. Now we have so much ground to cover here, it would be simply impossible to cover it all in this period of time. Uh, there's so many things that I want to talk about. I'm going to take a little opportunity right now uh, to attempt to cover some things that are very important to me. Uh, I realize that during the interview portion of this case, uh, we're going to have a, an awful lot of criticism that uh, Ross Becker didn't cover some areas. But I'll tell you, uh, in that period of time, there's days worth of uh, 
of uh, questions in this case that I would like to address, and I'm sure in the not too distant future I will be addressing those things. And I don't care who did this interview, it would have been virtually impossible to cover all of the issues. But as I say, there are some uh, things that are very close to me that I would like to attempt to cover in this uh, next half hour or so. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were upstairs, uh, uh, there's something about this room and the lighting in this room that I'd like to go into right now. Uh, it seemed to be very important to uh, uh, Brokaw and, and Marsha Clark seemed to um, do her normal thing, uh, referred to it uh, erroneously or inaccurately, I should say, throughout this trial, and that's the lighting that was here that night. I believe uh, Alan Park said words to the effect that um, uh, he didn't see or he couldn't detect any lighting in the house, not that there was no lights on, would probably would have been the uh, correct way to state it because from that front gate, uh, either one of my two gates, uh, it would have been virtually impossible. It is impossible and we're showing you that now this is a view that he would have had uh, of my house, but it's impossible to tell if any lights are on in my bedroom. As a matter of fact, I think I can turn on 90% of the lights on in my house, in my living room, uh, in my dining room, in my family room, my pool room, my bathroom, my bedroom, and uh, from the street, uh, you would not uh, notice that. From the street, what you can see is my daughter's room upstairs, Sydney Brooks, you can see my office and the kitchen. I, uh, it bothered me when I was in uh, court. I would go back to my cell and Marsha would say time and time again, there was no lights on in the house and when that shadowy figure had entered the house, lights went on all over the house and I was saying, boy, how can she say that? That's not true. You can't tell when lights come on all over my house. The only rooms you can see is the kitchen and since I wasn't packing a picnic, picnic to go to Chicago on, I didn't go in the kitchen and turn on the, any lights. I didn't go into my office, which, uh, which is the lower left room in my house, uh, looking at it. Uh, so those lights didn't come on, and upstairs there was no reason to go into Sydney Brooks' room because she was in Bun on Bundy. But I knew that the lamps were on in my house, and as you can see, you can put the lamps on in my entry, you can put the lamp on in my kitchen, you can put on all the other lights on in my house, and there is just no way for someone who's at either one of those gates to, one, see it, detect it, or testify that no lights were on. So, uh, Tom Brokaw, I hope that answers your question. I was not getting dressed in the dark. Park did say he thought he saw some light upstairs. Uh, he didn't know what it was, and I believe there's probably lights coming out of my uh, out of my bedroom to the front of the house. So, uh, Marsha, you can stop saying there was no lights on in my house. It was completely dark, and possibly, even though I know that the entry lamp was on, uh, possibly I may have hit my foyer, uh, it's not really a chandelier, it's an antique piece there and maybe that threw some more light on over the upstairs window or the closet that's next to my front door. Uh, I, I really can't say, but uh, enough of the lights. Uh, let's talk about opportunity. Uh, Marsha Clark and, and the, the prosecution team sort of went out of their way to establish uh, that I had plenty of opportunity. I'll tell you, there certainly would have been uh, many more opportune times if, uh, if I was uh, bent to, to commit a crime, which I didn't, uh, such as this, uh, I certainly wouldn't have picked this time to, to do it. Uh, I think it was very important for them to uh, make this crime take place at 10.15. Uh, they went out of their way to establish that with a barking dog, a welling dog, I guess was the word, and they avoided some witnesses, some key witnesses, people who walked by the scene, uh, people who were walking their dog, Heister, the young couple on their first date, uh, people coming out of dinner parties uh, uh, that night. Uh, they went out of their way to avoid calling those witnesses, and when these witnesses came forward, they went out of their way to attempt to discredit these witness, witnesses, to accuse them of trying to interject themselves in this case to to make money which I found uh, uh, sort of ironic uh, none of these people including witnesses that were on the airplane uh, uh, who copyrighted his notes none of these people have gone out to try to make a dime on this case but who went out and pimped it immediately Marsha Clark uh, Darden these guys went out immediately and made millions of dollars. Now, I don't begrudge them that. I truly do not begrudge uh, the defense team and the prosecution team for making money, but I think it's somewhat hypocritical 
of these people to try to cast aspersions on all of these other people, accuse them of trying to do it when they had their agents and they immediately took advantage of the celebrity that they received during this trial. Also during that opportunity, let me throw in this. The whole neighborhood knows my white Bronco. Knew it then. I'd spent much of the spring at Nicole's Bundy's house, more there than I did at my house. Everyone knew that car. That'd be the last car that I would drive uh, secretly uh, if I was going to attempt to commit a crime and Johnny did something during this cr uh, case when he put a knit hat on his head, I submit to you that I could be two, three blocks away with a knit hat on my head and people would be saying, hey, there's OJ. See him down there with the knit hat on his head. It's, uh, I don't know, I thought it was uh, ridiculous. Let's talk about the media a little bit and this is sort of a pet peeve uh, of mine. I, I just, I mean, I was being barbecued from, from day one on the media, and I, I had always understood the media is supposed to be uh, reporting the facts, you know, without interpretation. Well, that certainly didn't happen in this case. Uh, every place you look, there was an interpretations. Everybody was putting their spin on it time and time again from the very beginning. Now, you expect some things. You take with a grain of salt, for the most part, stories you'll see in the tabloids, uh, the National Enquirer, the Star, uh, the Globe, and those tabloid uh, publications. But I can tell you flat out, time and time again in this case, and this is something you're going to hear a little more about because uh, that will be my next uh, litigation, uh, um, um, my, my battle <laughs> or my fight to get justice from the, these publications because they didn't shade the truth. They didn't interpret, uh, and, and interpret evidence. They flat out lied time and time again. They made up stories. Once they made up stories, some of the uh, uh, video uh, tabloid uh, shows, some under the guise of legitimate uh, interview shows, they ran with those stories. Uh, they brought in uh, psychiatrists and analysts to analyze why O.J. did various things during the trial and since the trial, things that I didn't come close to doing. Uh, uh, just recently, there was a big story uh, about me attempting suicide in the National Enquirer. That's a flat-out lie. I will put everything that I own. You can come in here, National Enquirer, and interview me daily. You can take everything I own. If you can show me anything in that story that's true, any doctor who's ever entered this house to, to help me, my daughter, you bring my kids into it, my son on Thanksgiving that I went to his house and wasn't welcome, that's totally false. His mother, Marguerite, her husband, Anthony, myself and my daughter and a couple of my daughter's girlfriends, we spent Thanksgiving together and later on when some of the other younger kids came, we didn't watch any football, uh, we left, the mother and I. Marguerite and I left, but never have I attempted suicide in any way, shape, or form. I saw stories where uh, Neiman Marcus, Neiman Marcus uh, uh, denied me the right to shop a after I was one. I never called Neiman Marcus to do that. Two, the manager of Neiman Marcus called me to apologize for the story, to say it wasn't true, and to say I was more than welcome to come in there. I guess what bothers you, you can see a Jay Leno make jokes. It was painful to me, but I didn't think there was any real malice in the jokes that he was making. You see a Howard Stern, a guy that, hey, he's irreverent about everything. And even though I didn't like it, I thought some of it was, uh, was vicious, that's Howard Stern. So to an extent, you understand it. It's the legitimate press, people under the guise of journalism, people like Newsweek magazine and Time magazine. I mean, what was that all about? Time Magazine, as if this crime wasn't bad enough, they darkened my picture. They put my picture on the cover. What was the purpose of that? The darker you are, is that the more sinister and evil that you might be? I mean, it's, 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 it's embarrassing almost. This is Time Magazine. Newsweek is a magazine that I subscribe to, and time and time again, I'll talk a little about that in a second, they, uh, they just wrote stories. I think one of the most racist stories uh, that I had ever read under the guise of journalism they wrote in August of 94. In that story, they accused me of going to the University of Southern California, a white school. They implied because I wanted to be white. The University of Southern California were one of the most storied sports histories of any school in the country. The first All-American in the early 20th century at USC was Bryce Taylor, 
a black man. So many great athletes, white, black minorities, have gone in and out of that university. And I went there because I thought it was the best university that I can go for, for an education and for the athletic tradition there. They accused me in this article for taking diction lessons because I want to sound white. Now, many of you out there wrote me in my early days in television, especially on Monday Night Football, told me you were fans of mine, but you wish I would work on my diction. Like most actors, like most people who work in television, in the movies, uh, I took that to heart and I hired a diction co coach so I wouldn't embarrass you or myself or my family by my diction. I had a lot of ghetto in the way that I talk, but they accused me of trying to be white. Sir Lawrence Olivier, to the day he died, every morning started off with his voice coach, and I don't think there's any black person working in television, a white person who's serious about that craft that doesn't work on their diction and their voice, but they said it because I wanted to be white or act more white or sound more white. Uh, in there, there was some pictures, one with a group of women at a charity affair. I think they were with Hawaiian Tropic, and they implied that I was looking for sleazy, sleazy women looking for stuff. A couple of those women called Larry King and said that they approached me for the picture, and I didn't uh, attempt to date them or hit on them in any way, shape, or fortune. Not that I'm a, not above that. Uh, and probably the thing that was most embarrassing to me, they cropped the picture of me with what we call a comedy stripper in front of me. A stripper. Let me tell you about that night. That happened in my backyard. We were celebrating mine and, and Al Cowling's 40th birthday. Nicole and my 10th year together. Denise Brown's 30th birthday. Joe Stellini's 50th birthday. Arnell Simpson and Tanya Brown, Nicole's sister's graduation from high school. We had 400 of our friends and family there. We were on the stage. Nicole thought it was funny and sent this comic stripper. My, my family was there, her family was there, all our friends was there, and what did they do? They cropped this picture to try to imply that here I am hanging in some sleazy area with strippers, you know, and all our family was there, and they knew exactly what they were doing when they did that. It was totally embarrassing. And, and the TV people, I mean, I'm a big fan of Katie Couric's. The day I got out of jail, the day after I should say that uh, the verdict came in, I picked up my kids. I didn't go to any bakery, even though, though I saw some nice young kids say that I was in a bakery. I didn't go to any bakery. I went straight up to Mulholland Drive. Uh, I picked up my kids. We met there and we went to a friend's house. That night we slept together. The next morning we were up early as kids are prone to be. My kids, my son Justin wanted me to go into a uh, video arcade room that was at this house and play with him. And Sydney Brooke, my daughter, wanted me to get into jacuzzi with her. While I was trying to debate with the kids uh, which I would do because I didn't want to get into the jacuzzi, uh, the housekeeper came out and said, O.J., uh, uh, Mr. Simpson, uh, uh, would you come in here? I walked into this kitchen and I saw Katie Couric sitting with a woman named Sheila Weller, an author. And what this Sheila Weller was reporting, uh, secondhand, I guess, from an informed source that was another writer from some paper in New York, was that that night I had returned to Laguna at 2 a.m. in the morning that the Browns were worried. They didn't know where we were. I didn't call. And when I arrived at my daughter, Sydney Brooke, my daughter was traumatized. These people are resorting. I hear this, this hypocrisy about the kids. You know, you should think about these kids. And these people are using my kids, lying on my kids to make money. They said that we arrived at 2 a.m. that night. Now, if I was a mother or a parent anywhere in America, I'm watching the Today Show. I expect to get facts. I expect honest reporting on this show. I would be very upset. I wouldn't blame any woman in America that moment to hate O.J. Simpson. How could he do this to his kids? When the facts of the matter, it was a flat-out lie. My kids were with me, and when the person I was with called NBC to say this isn't true, he knew people at NBC, he was told, how do you know it's not true? That's the standard now. How do you know it's not true? That shouldn't be the standard. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, motive. Something that Darden had a comment on and, uh, at one point in this case, especially uh, during his uh, closing statements. <sighs> I'm going to take a little time here and try to tell you and give you a picture of uh, my relationship with Nicole those last two and a half years. Uh, uh, you heard Darden, jealousy, control. These were the things that he claimed led to me 
committing this crime. First, I want to say that in the 15 years before 1992, Nicole never at any point in time ever gave me a reason to be jealous. Uh, that wasn't Nicole's style. Her mother used to tell me, uh, it's amazing, Nicole doesn't even see any other man. If we had any arguments uh, before that time, it was about things that I was doing things, a lot of them I wasn't that proud of, but things that uh, I had done during that period of time. In January, it was January 6th of 1992, Nicole and I went to lunch and she informed me that she wanted uh, uh, to separate, not to have a divorce, she wanted to separate. She said uh, there was nothing that I had done. Uh, as a matter of fact, she commended on me on my actions for the previous two years, but she felt that she just wanted to be on her own for a while. Uh, of course, I attempted to talk her out of it. Uh, she was pretty vehement about doing it for the next 30 days. Uh, we lived together in this house. Uh, near the end of that 30 days, I told her if she didn't file for a divorce that I would because I didn't want to go a year uh, deciding that we wanted to have a divorce and then go a year trying to get that divorce and I felt there would be plenty of time in those the year that I thought it would take to have a final de de uh, a degree in a, uh, a the divorce settlement that uh, we would know if we wanted to be together or not. Over the next three months, she moved to uh, Gretna Green, and uh, we spent a lot of time together during those three months. We had an agreement that if any, either one of us thought we were going to get into a serious relationship, that we would call the other person, and uh, we would tell that other person. No one can tell you. No one can tell you. In this period of time, from January of 1992 to uh, May of 1993, nearly a year and a half that Nicole and I ever had any argument, any single argument about who she was dating, where she was doing, I mean going, where she was traveling to, who she was traveling with, or who I was dating. In that period of time, actually it was in May, I met Paula Barbieri and she was the only girl that I dated uh, seriously during that period of time. Nicole uh, had a, numerous uh, people that she dated during that period of time. Uh, during uh, late February, Nicole began to send things to me through the kids, cupcakes, uh, musical tapes, uh, and began to call my office and call my home to speak to me. Uh, I was in a relationship, a healthy relationship with Paula Barbieri. Uh, I had uh, conveyed to Nicole through a letter and through Kathy Randa that uh, I really didn't want to get involved in uh, anything in her life unless it concerned the kids. Uh, Nicole didn't accept that. One day, I think it was mid-March, she showed up here and informed me that she didn't like some of the things that was going on in her life and that uh, she missed me, she loved me, and she wanted us to get back together. I told her that I was not interested in that time. I did love her, but I was in a healthy relationship and I just wasn't interested in getting back together. Over the next three months, Nicole was quite insistent uh, about that. She came to the golf course. Uh, she came to my house. Uh, I even went to Mexico and her and her friends showed up in Mexico. Interestingly enough, I never considered that stalking. I never would call that stalking. That was a woman that was in love with a man and felt she wanted to get back with that man. By May of 1993, Nicole had convinced me that maybe we should try it again. And uh, I informed Paula Barbieri about it. We had long discussions about it. We had no fight. She was hurt. And I was even hurt that I had to hurt her, but I felt an obligation to myself to my kids and I didn't know exactly how I felt about Nicole that I must try it and I told Nicole I would try it for a year but there was a few conditions. One of the conditions is I wasn't going to let her move back in because if it didn't work I didn't want my kids moving in and out. Uh, I would try it for a year and uh, there was only one friend of hers, one person, a female, that I would not socialize with. Not that she couldn't and she continued to socialize with this person. Uh, but I would not socialize with this person. That wasn't Faye Rusnick, uh, uh, incidentally. For the next year, Nicole and I was together. You hear we were together and split up. That's not so. We never split up. From May, I mean, January 6th of 1992 to May, Mother's Day, whatever that was, in 1993, Nicole and I was apart. We weren't together. In May of 1993, even though we spent a lot of time together in the two months leading up to May of 93, Nicole and I got back together. It was a one-year uh, trial period. I set that time of one year. And one year to that day, Mother's Day, actually it was the day after Mother's Day in 1994, I told Nicole after returning from Puerto Rico and uh, some things that took place that I can't even tell you about. When I was in Puerto Rico, I spoke to Nicole's mother. While I was 3,000 miles away, I, Nicole was having some problems. I didn't understand them. When I came back, I told her that I just could not 
do this anymore. I told her I would try it through the summer if she would go to therapy. Nicole did not want to go to therapy, so we split up. No problems, no arguments, no nothing. That week we attended a couple of affairs together for our kids. Uh, we had dinner together a couple of nights uh, that week. I was told by Kathy Randa that Paula Barbieri was coming in town for one day. I surprised her at the airport, met her, and uh, we, uh, she wasn't dating anybody, and we decided to give it a shot to, s to start trying to work to see if we can get back together. The following week, and this is the 30 days preceding Nicole's death, the following week Nicole was ill. She had double pneumonia. I spent that week, uh, when I returned from New York, I believe, uh, going to her house in the morning bringing her her favorite scones and coffee and in the afternoon obviously to do the homework with the kids and bring her dinner and see if she needed any medication and I spent much of that week uh, uh, tending to Nicole she had a birthday that week and uh, we talked about you heard so much about this bracelet uh, yes, I brought Nicole actually a cigarette lighter, a gold Cartier cigarette lighter for her birthday. Uh, but uh, when I was at her house, her kids said, what did we give her? I had a gift for Paula Barbieri that I was going to give her to celebrate our anniversary three, uh, when we first met or first dated, which would have been three days later. One thing you'll see in her deposition, this piece of bracelet, uh, jewelry that I brought, this bracelet, went directly, sapphire and diamonds, with uh, jewelry I had previously bought Paula Barbieri. Totally not the type of jury I'd ever given Nicole. She even commented on, you never bought me anything like that. But I had no gift from the kids, and uh, I gave her that bracelet. But in any event, uh, for the next week, uh, I went out of town. I came back in town. I was hosting maybe three or 400 kids and their parents here at my house for my son's preschool. Nicole came over. Everyone who saw us that day saw two people who got along. I, many of them would have probably thought we were still together. I was watching the NBA Finals in here. Nicole came into this living room and laid la literally across my lap. People were here. She went upstairs because she was still feeling weak and laid in my bed. Uh, and uh, later on that night went home. For the next week, everything was fine with us. And then one night, I think I talked about this a little earlier, she called me. She was pretty upset that Faye Resnick had, uh, was attending an affair uh, with us. And uh, of course, Faye never told her that Faye insisted on going to that affair. I didn't like the fact that she called me and yelled at me. I didn't like the fact that my housekeeper, Gigi, uh, came to me complaining that uh, Nicole had uh, was upset with her and came to her because uh, she wasn't here one weekend when it was her weekend off. I informed her that you work for me, not Nicole. I had already uh, lost my favorite housekeeper two months previous because Nicole came into this house and had a physical confrontation with that person and it was at that time I decided that I wanted to pretty much cut off uh, any type of communications with Nicole unless it had something to do with the kids. Uh, uh, the week of her death, I spoke to Nicole, uh, she called my office, uh, she wanted to make sure that I would be in town for my kids' recital and how many tickets that I, I might need. Uh, I spoke to her later on that week because I was back east in Washington and in Connecticut and I just found out that Justin's school, his preschool, was having a ceremony for his graduation and I wasn't able to attend that. Uh, of course, the day of her murder, uh, I saw her at a recital. She saved me a seat that was two seats from her. I sat two seats from her. I spoke to her family. Other than asking for my ticket, I didn't speak to her. Uh, one of the police reports in this case uh, pointed out that uh, Dominique Brown stated that Nicole said to her, see, OJ won't even talk to me. Even though you pundits are out there saying she scorned me that day and that was a trigger for me committing this crime. It was totally the other way around. I wasn't scorning her. I just didn't want to get involved in, uh, in any conversation with her at that time. Even though at one point, a few times when our daughter was dancing, we looked at each other and sort of mouthed that Sydney was beautiful. Uh, when that affair, affair was over, I was outside talking to friends, talking to Dr. Fishman, teasing with Lou Brown, certainly not having any kind of dour uh, personality, not being angry. Fortunately, that was a video that proved that. I will say this that in the year and a half that Nicole and I was part, we never argued about any person that she was dating, any person. In the month that Nicole and I was apart leading up to her death, no friend of hers will tell you that I called them about anything. In fact, it was 
completely the opposite. Her best friend in this world, Cora Fishman, a person who was interviewed by Marsha Clark and Philip Van Adder about this murder, about Nicole's and my relationship. And as she spoke about our relationship, time and time again, Marsha would say to her, interrupt her and say, oh, you're not her friend. Oh, how can you say that? This is a woman that has not made a dime off this uh, case. She refused to do anything for money, yet they tried to uh, intimidate her and skewer what she had to say about Nicole's and uh, my uh, relationship. It was, it was Cora that came to me uh, roughly 10 days before Nicole's death and said, OJ, you need to take Nicole and the kids and get out of L.A. I do feel some guilt. I feel guilt because Nicole wanted to move in with me. She made that clear to me and everybody many times during that year from 93 to 94, and I refuse. I feel guilt because I didn't listen to, to Cora Fishman that day. I feel guilt because uh, people like Faye Rusnick was able to say to me, Nicole loves you, OJ, and you're back with Paula. I feel guilt about a lot of those th things, but I do not feel uh, guilt for the murder of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. I did not do that. I swear before God, I did not commit these crimes. And I ask you, members of the uh, community, I don't think I'm going to change any of your guys' mind with this tape. I just want you to listen to the facts. I ask the media, just print the facts. People want to know facts, not skewered testimony, not lies, not interpretations, uh, just the facts. And uh, I ask you all, I mean, I've been good to everybody. I don't think there's anybody out there that won't say that wherever they met me all over this country for the last 30 years, I took time. I treated you the way I wanted to be treated. My mother taught me. I knew religion long before Rosie Greer came to jail. I grew up in Evergreen Baptist Church. I was taught you do unto others, and that's what I've tried to do my entire life. You know, I tried to treat people the way I wanted to be treated. I don't think there's anybody out there that ever met me anywhere in airports or in ballparks or on the street that I wasn't kind to you. I didn't give, I didn't treat you the way I thought you wanted to be treated. Anybody who's ever written me, I wrote them back. Charities that ever called me, I always sent them something at my cost. I only asked you to give me that courtesy, to treat me the way I treated you. And I asked the media to print the facts. I'll say to you once again, I have nothing but compassion for the Goldmans and for the Browns, but I lost just as much as you did. I lost more than you did, because I lost a person that I love. I've lost my life, and I've lost my ability. I don't think so. My ability to, to provide for the people around me, that's all I want to do, provide for the, my family, my kids, and give me the opportunity and a fair shake to say what I need to say. I listen to what everybody else said. I try to do that with some dignity. I ask you to listen to me, and you judge. But I swear to you before my God, I did not commit these crimes. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me.